Oh, welcome to our meeting. It is an honor to have you all here tonight. Uh, tonight's invocation will be by Victoria Thomas from the Agape Hampton Road Spiritual Center. Welcome. How grateful I am to just stop in this moment and to take that holy breath, recognizing a mighty power and a presence, a presence of unconditional love that truly created each and every council member out of itself, placed all of its wisdom, inclusivity, and bounty into each individual here within the sound of my voice. And I am knowing from this oneness that this meeting is blessed and a blessing, that this highest good consciousness unfolds for this great city and for all of its rescue teams and firemen and police officers and citizens, that it acts as a beacon of transformation and possibilities for all of Hampton Roads, for our state of Virginia and for our great nation and the entire planet. God is love, God is good, and so it is, amen. Amen. And pledge of allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All righty. Madam Clerk, do you have a speaker's policy? It's in there. All righty. All righty. Okay, um, okay uh, this forward, we're going to ask for uh, the roll call. All present, sir. Okay, and at this point, we're going to ask for the certification of the closed session. So moved. Second. Okay, uh, vote is open. Keep hitting that sheet. By a vote of 10 to 0, you certify the closed session being in accordance with the motion to recess. Okay, thank you. And at this point, we're going to ask for uh, minutes of the special session of, of August 10th, 2021, special session August 12th, 2021, and the informal and formal sessions of August 17th, 2021. Second. Okay, the vote is open. One second. <coughs> Ms. Wilson, Ms. thank you. By a vote of nine to zero of Ms. Wooten abstaining, you have approved the minutes as submitted. Okay, uh, thank you. At this point, we're going to have a public hearing on the applications for the Transportation of Alternatives Program. Uh, we have one speaker, Barbara Messner. <laughs> we have one speaker, Barbara Messner. prepared I came here to honor the, the firefighters uh, that was on the top of the agenda okay which item public hearing which one there's only one there's only one oh, Miss okay. Master. okay I see. thank okay. you yeah I was getting ready yeah. sorry um, you know the the full agenda isn't ready until it was Friday it was a long weekend so anyway um, application for transportation alternatives program um, you know, we have a problem with basic transportation. You've never resolved basic transportation for the working middle class poor and the people that don't have cars. We need basic um, ride. We don't need to bring back um, light rail. Um, you know, we voted it down several times. So, anyway. Um, I have one thing that I brought. This is on the public hearing. Um, now, since we're honoring, you know, Reba and um, the firefighters and their FEMA team, um, you know, we need to 
we need to uh, fix the Tidewater Veterans Memorial. There's still no flags since February. So um, we just need to uh, honor everyone and take care of everything in the city. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's all the speakers, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, a couple quick announcements. Earlier, the council, uh, as you know, we are going to be uh, appointing a new vice mayor shortly, and we're going to defer that for a bit. Uh, we're going to have a discussion at the uh, retreat. I believe we're going to be starting, uh, Mr. Dehaney, looking at 1230, and it'll be the first item on the agenda. We're with you know, Mr. Dehaney? 830, Mayor. 830. 830. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> no, forgive me. That's early. I had to get up to go to the rock and roll the other day at 530, so... But, you know, thank you for that correction. Mm -hmm. But it'll give the, you know, the candidates opportunities to talk and we can figure out some of uh, the things that is going to work exponentially for not only the council members, but for the public. And uh, Mr. Uh, Taylor Adams I now has a, a surprise uh, announcement. I have, I have a question. Yes. Just a, just a point of order. I thought we had to vote on. No, uh, according to the uh, city attorney? If there is consensus that you're deferring it, it can be deferred. If someone has a motion to make, a motion can be made. It's, it's, it's the will of the body. I didn't, I didn't realize that there was consensus on that matter. I thought there was going to be discussion prior to having um, that motion be made. And I thought that motion was going to be made. I'm, I'm perfectly open to having it deferred, but I thought a motion was going to be made followed up with discussion. No, no, but once again, I think, you know, we're going to have, uh, have the discussion at the uh, retreat, and then when we ask for questions. If, uh, if there's not consensus, a motion should be made. Yeah. So point of, a point of order, then, I guess a, a motion should be made. And if I'm, like I say, I'm most certainly open to deferring it, but there's, there should be a motion on the floor. I guess that's unfinished business, Mr. City Attorney. You can do it in unfinished business, or you could... If, the, if, if, if you want to call it now, you can, too. It's, that's I, I'll tell you, why don't we do it under unfinished business, okay? <laughs> no, that won't be a problem at all, Mr. Rouse. Okay, um, and then uh, Mr. Adams? Yeah, there we go. Why don't we have more extra? <coughs> Thank you, Mayor. <coughs> and uh, with me, uh, someone that, that everyone here will recognize, Dot Wood, who's served our community for a long time. Um, but uh, this past week, uh, uh, the Global Traveler brand of magazines, which includes Global Traveler, Trazzy Travel, and Wherever Travel, had their awards in Washington, D.C. Um, Mrs. Wood and I were, were on site for the awards, um, uh, and uh, Virginia Beach won too. We, were won, uh, we won uh, Favorite Beach Town, Mid-Southern United States, and uh, we won Best Family Friendly Beach Town in the Southeast and Mid-Atlantic. And so we're here to present this award to you, Mayor and Council. Great accolade for our community. Important to note, Global Traveler has over half a million readers, and so a great day for our city. Uh, thank you. We've always known this is the best city in the world, and I just wanted to mention that some of the other winners were Italy, uh, Saudi Arabian Airlines. I think we were the only U.S. winner. Wow. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, this is a, uh, this is a community win for us, not yes, only sir. as a council, but as a city, but also the people that live here. So once again, I truly wanted to thank you. Okay? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now it is my privilege uh, to read a resolution. Whereas on Tuesday, September 11th, 2001, the United States was the target of an unprovoked senseless act of terrorism resulting in the deadliest attack on U.S. soil since the bombing of Pearl Harbor in 1941. The terrorist attack killed more than 3,000 people and injured thousands more in New York, New York, Shanksville, Pennsylvania, and Arlington, Virginia, at the Pentagon. And whereas on October 7, 2001, Operation Enduring Freedom, the American-led international effort, began with U.S. forces effectively removing the Taliban from operational power in Afghanistan, with American forces continuing to track the mastermind behind the September 11th attack, Osama bin Laden, 
who was eventually located and killed on May 2nd in 2011 in Abbottabad, Pakistan. Whereas in the days after September 11th, the spirit of America was revitalized, giving way to the patriotism with a stronger nation, emerging with pride and true love of country. And whereas on September 11, 2001, Virginia Task Force II, consisting of 76 members, deployed to the Pentagon, working night shift, searching, removing debris, recovering bodies, replacing and storing up approximately 30 to 40 columns returning eight days later on September 19, 2001. Of the 76 members deployed, 47 were Virginia Beach Task Force members. Now, therefore, be it resolved on this 20th anniversary of 9-11, the mayor and members of city council urge citizens to recognize the heroism of our first responders, military service members, and the volunteers who, without pause, responded to these tragic events with courage, selfless compassion, determination and skill and remember the victims and innocent lives lost as a result of the tragic events of September 11, 2001. Be it further resolved that the Virginia Beach City Council pauses during the formal session to reflect upon the tragic day 20 years ago, given under our hands on the seventh day of September, 2021, and let me just say, and we'll say it again and we'll say it often, Virginia Beach is a city of heroes. And we thank you, we commend you for being so part of making not only our city safe, but what you do for this great nation, indivisible, one nation under God. Thank you. And now, in an effort to recognize all of you, I'm going to ask you each to come up to the podium and state your name. I'll start us off, Mayor. Uh, one thing I just wanted to say, thank you so much, and really give credit where credit is due, all the way back to some of y'all sitting here kind of in the middle uh, with Chief Harry Dizel. You know, he, it was his vision that started this whole team off. Uh, so that was really greatly appreciated. And then also to say that this team, as you know, we just got back from Miami and uh, Louisiana and New York. We've been very busy. You're, you're one of the top teams in the nation, so we couldn't do it without you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Steve Cover. I was one of the task force leaders for the deployment. Thank you, Steve. Good evening. I'm Daryl Funiak. I was one of the technical search specialists. Thank you, Daryl. Hey, I'm Jim Ingledew. I was actually his boss. I was a search team <laughs> manager. <laughs> <laughs> Keen Black, I was on the rescue component. Oh, great. Dennis Keen, as a rescue team manager, in charge of all these guys. <laughs> you got a lot of people in charge there. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, Harold Hill, I was logistics. Thank you. Leon Dexter, I was a rescue team leader. Thank you. Want me to actually walk up here? Doug Kidmail, <laughs> heavy equipment and rigging. Glenn Burnett, I was a rescue squad member. Thank you. Uh, Wayne Black, logistics. Michael Ronan, I was plans officer. David Doss, logistics. John Thomas, Logistics. Paul oh, Perez, a rescue uh, team member. Good evening. Rob Darling, Program Manager for the Task Force. 
Jim, sir, I was a plans officer to Pentagon was my last deployment. And then I did cop stuff after that. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> but once again, thanks again, Mrs. Henley. I happened to be one of the many people who were standing outside on Birdneck Road that day when you all returned to Virginia Beach. It was one of the most solemn but proud moments, I think, we had had. And I understand coming back from Washington as you all went through locality after locality, people stopped their cars and got out and, and uh, let you know how much we appreciate it. But thank you all, and you make Virginia Beach proud. Any other council person? Once again, thanks again. <laughs> Beach is indeed a city of heroes. All righty. Um, okay, we're going to be moving on to um, the agenda now, and I'm going to be reading uh, the speaker's policy going forward. I want to remind everyone that the city council speaker policy that allows certain representatives of groups to speak for 10 minutes applies only to planning items. All other speakers whether speaking individually or on behalf of a group, will have three minutes to speak. Speakers are reminded that comments during the formal portion of the meeting must be limited to the subject of the item that is being considered by the council at the time you are called. When speakers are called on each item, the clerk will call those individuals who have signed up to speak. We have several items where, with only one speaker signed up. As such, the clerk will call the speaker and identify each item that has been registered on. The speaker will receive three minutes to comment on each item. <coughs> Again, the speaker must limit uh, his or her comments to the subject matter of the items they have signed up to address. Finally, I call upon all speakers and all persons in the chamber to be civil in their discussion and decorum. Whatever views you hold and wish to express, the city council wants to hear from you and ensure that all viewpoints and all persons are respected. The best way to do it is for all of us to strive for civility and respect. Madam Clerk, we have speakers. Yes, um, we have one speaker signed up on multiple items. Barbara Messner. And the items that are being pulled that you will not be speaking on at this time is our number two okay. and number 15. Okay. Um, I wish more people would read the agendas and I wish you wouldn't put so many things on the agendas. Um, the plexiglass doesn't go all the way back. It's not for anyone else, you know. The whole, the whole system is a mess. That's why I come here. Okay. Um, J1, amend section 13 through 130, Stormwater Management Ordinance, uh, Stormwater Appeals Board. Um, We've had problems with flooding and stormwater for decades, decades. Um, and we shouldn't be pay paying for broken pumps, you know, clogged drains, and uh, outrageous water fees. Um, I'm just going to keep this short because there's a lot of people here. But, you know, you haven't taken care of the city for forever. We still have Norfolk uh, sewage, sewer pipes, water pipes, and you just patch, you patch everything. Uh, okay, that's 1A, B, uh, Public Works Design Standards, um, Manual Variance. Uh, 
we need to have strict standards and code enforcement. Anybody driving around the city knows that what, what you used to take care of and what you take care of now are, are 180. We have a $3 billion budget and you don't take care of maintenance in the city. You just keep building and building and building and raising our debt. We have $3 billion debt. Okay, that's one. Okay, you said skip two. Okay, three. Ordinance to create the Atlantic Park Community Development Authority. This is the dome project. It's morphed into I don't know how many different names. Generation P, um, the wave, Kelly Slater's the only one with the working wave, uses public private education money. It should be going to our schools. Uh, so does the sports center. It also uses HUD money. So, and before I forget, many of y'all have conflicts with the developers and with your, with your interests. Uh, the dome project, you know, is tied to uh, Dominion and normally even Will Sessoms left the room when there were conflicts uh, on his votes. Okay, um, let's see, three, yeah. Development authority, y'all are the authority, you're responsible for your money. You shouldn't have liaisons, you shouldn't have appointments, committees, commissions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You are ultimately responsible for everything that happens in the city, every non-bid thing that you give away. You're still responsible, all of you. Um, yeah, this is a taxing authority. Okay, um, let's see, three, cre yeah, that's Atlantic Park. You keep changing the name. It's kind of like deja vu, uh, the arena deal. ESG, Mid-Atlantic, et cetera, et cetera. They never had financing. Who's, who's watching the money? Who, who's watching your money? And why aren't there loans to private developers? It's, it's air money, it's not your money, it's air money. We have uncontrolled growth, we have flooding, potholes everywhere, sinkholes. Um, okay. Um, okay, four. What was the other one you said that was pulled, Amanda? Ms. Barnes? Fifteen. Fifteen. I just think that out of 450,000 people, you know, the fact that you didn't put this up and that, you know, there's problems, school starting soon, and, you know, the, the full agenda went up after 5 o'clock Friday. There's nobody working uh, those days. Hi, Ms. Inley. Hi, Mr. Jones. Okay. Okay. Resolution to support revenue sharing projects and authorize the city manager to execute project agreements with VDOT, Virginia Transportation. You know, it's air money. You're having all these authorities and you're blending air money with state and federal. Um, okay, this is Shore Drive Corridor <coughs> Improvements, uh, Elbow Road, Pungo Ferry, and Nemo Parkway. That's Miss Henley's. Um, like I said, we have a budget, you haven't taken care of the roads, and traffic's horrible. You know, these poor firefighters, you know, there's deadly car accidents all the time. And our police, you know, they still don't have fully funded police. Okay. Uh -oh. um, I have other notes, but I'm going to keep it short for all these people. Uh, five, uh, resolution to support the city's 2021 applications to VDOT, Transportation Alternatives Set Aside Program. Is this like a, another slush fund? Um, you set aside a, a slush fund using COVID money and um, it 
and you set aside money and misused it on the victim families. You know, there... Okay. Um... Yeah, set aside program for 2022-2023 and 2023-2024. You're setting aside money and we have debt. You need to pay down the debt. The 2002 um, Third Convention Center has 15 million, um, you know, operating debt, debt service every year. It's not even due to be paid off until 2028, and half the people that come there, um, you know, they don't even have to pay. Okay. Six, resolution to authorize a contract between Virginia Beach Community Services Board and the Commonwealth of Virginia. Virginia Beach and the Commonwealth. It's all air money. You shouldn't be combining it with the state when the state gives it to you and you're supposed to be responsible for it. Um, okay, seven. Resolution to authorize increased contributions to Department of the Army Ray Rudy Inlet Maintenance Dredging. You've been, you've been putting the sand back on the beaches since since the beginning of time, you used to truck it in. Now all the burrow pits are depleted. And you dredge up the ocean. The ocean floor is nothing like it used to be. Um, and Croatan still doesn't have a beach because the dredging sends the beach back to Rudy Inlet. Okay, eight. You notice this isn't three minutes. And that's because of the people that are here for other things. That's like 52 items. 52. Okay, and you should be at the convention center. This room was basically condemned by OSHA, EPA, and the health department on October 9th because of mold, asbestos, HVAC, you know, problems. So we should be at the convention center. That should be priority. And, uh, okay, eight. Ordinance to extend the date satisfying conditions in closing an unimproved portion of the right-of-way adjacent to two residential properties located at the south side of 75th Street and West Atlantic. Basically, there's 20 properties. There's a right-of-way for a reason. That's for uh, public safety, and it's for access for people. So I'm opposed to all of these. These are all on the land side. Um, there's hardly any, and everyone who gets the short-term rentals or all these, you know, improvements to their houses and more land, air land, he gave 200 feet of air land to the people on, at the north end at the ocean front in order to talk them into the uh, sand replenishment program. Look how far people have to walk to the ocean. Uh, it's a pretty expensive amount of beach to take care of. Um, like tractor trailers cleaning the beach every morning at 5 a.m. Okay, um, I know there's people interested in this, but most people don't want to come here. And uh, I don't know if you all have had letters. I assume if you had, you would mention it. But um, yeah, there's, there's no parking. Everything's condos, apartments, timeshare, short-term rentals. There's hardly anything left of the wonderful beach that we had in the 80s and 90s. There's hardly anything left. Okay, 10, extend the date to satisfy conditions in closing 10,645 square foot portion right away, city right away, uh, Lord Dunmore. Uh, Usually, when you do this, it's for a private developer. But e either way, the right-of-ways, you give them to the cell towers, Dominion, uh, 
Verizon, and they're, they're all allowed to pass on the fees that you charge them to us. Okay, 11. Authorize temporary encroachment. City-owned property, uh, Lake Wesley, uh, Virginia Dare Drive. Okay, this is Croatan area. Um, yeah, everybody has a boat, a pool in their backyard because there's no way to get to the oceanfront and the beach is not safe and it's not friendly and it's overcrowded. So more people are commercializing their backyards and getting boats and pools, which adds to the problems. Yeah. Okay. All right. 12, ordinance to accept and appropriate from FEMA. Um to the fire department operating budget. Um, you know, since 1999, when William Bailey was the fire chief, you know, he talked about the problems with retaining the firemen and having fully staffed. This has been going on a long time. So, um, yeah, it's great that they go to help other people, but we need to make sure that we have fully staffed trucks and equipment here at all times for the 450,000 plus anywhere from 15,000 to 30,000 per weekend at the oceanfront because all of our first responders are overworked. Everything you do uh, is a burden on them. They don't complain, most of them don't complain. Um, okay, 13. Uh, Department of Health, 14. 14,000 Department of Health operating budget 2021-2022. Um, EMS services operating budget from their operating budget to the rescue squad operations and training. You're just shifting money around. There needs to be enough money in every department. Mr. Moss, you know, when you ran in 2011, you promised you'd keep an eye on the finances. Anybody who pays attention to this knows that none of y'all do. You know, token no votes once in a while, you know. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip some of these just to save time. Let's see. Okay, uh, 95,000 from the Commonwealth, that's air taxes too, from the 21-22 uh, budget, uh, clerk of circuit court, uh, compensation supplements for employees. A lot of these employees are working a lot of overtime. And it's none of it's necessary, especially during the pandemic. Uh, we either have one or we don't. The beach is wide open, it's never been closed. And yet our kids can't go to school. You can't have different rules for different people and you can't put that silly plexiglass there that doesn't go all the way back and act like you care about, you know, the quality of air in here for everyone. Um, all right, 14. This is a lot of items. I'm glad you think it's funny, Mr. Tower, with all your conflicts with Kaufman and Knowles. Glad you, you and Mr. Bellucci think everything's so funny. Um, you know, People are here for certain things in their backyard. They, you know, okay. Um, you know, more transfers from DMV. From the DMV uh, to the Virginia Beach Police Department. 50% uh, in-kind match. Overtime, overtime, overtime. 29,400 overtime. 36,200 overtime. 77,503 overtime. And it's for seatbelt laws, DUIs, and uh, expenses for speed enforcement. Okay, we're going to open a public hearing on planning. The items um, for that are not on consent for planning, Ms. Messner, are three, four, and seven. So nobody's here for anything else. Okay. Oh, right. Not on consent. Okay. You'll be speaking on one, two, five, and six. One, two, three, 
Um, one, two, five, and six. I asked which ones were pulled, not which ones I was speaking on. So just uh, ma'am, I I just asked which ones are pulled. You said three, three, four, and seven. Three, four, and seven. That's a lot easier. Thank you. No, not really. Okay. Um, right away, street closure. Um, 334 square feet portion of unimproved right of ways, uh, 45th Street at the north end, deferred from November 2019. Uh, okay. Two, um, Virginia Beach Independence LLC, Limited Liability Corporation, change in zoning from neighborhood business uh, to community business, commercial retail. Um, and that's deferred from September. You have too many things on the agenda, and when there's opposition, you defer it, and then if they don't show up, you put it through. <coughs> okay. Um, three is pull, four is pull, five. Uh, VTS Lind Mayflower owner, conditional use permit short-term rentals. I lived at the Mayflower. That's in 1980. That is an old building. I think it was built in the 50s. And you want to make short-term rentals out of those properties? It, it's ridiculous. The whole city is short-term rentals. And you all vote for them, <coughs> all of you. Yeah, I, I saw the article on somebody's Facebook page, you know, pretending they don't care when they've already voted repeatedly on all these, <coughs> including the person they were going to have for vice mayor that voted for all of, all of them, too, if, when they showed up. Okay, six. Um, conditional use permit, alternative residential development, Princess Anne District, uh, Miss Henley. All right. Seven. That should be it. That should be it. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to move for approval under the consent agenda for ordinances and resolutions, item J1, which is ordinance to amend A, sec a section 1-3 and 1-30 of the Stormwater Management Ordinance, Appendix D, Ray Stormwater Appeals Board, and B, Section 1.2, the Public Works Design Standards Manual, Ray Variances, deferred from July 6, 2021, uh, by Councilman Moss, uh, requested a deferral for 60 days. Item J3, which is an ordinance to create the Atlantic Park Community Development CDA. <coughs> Item four, which is resolutions to support the revenue sharing projects and authorize the city manager to execute project agreements with the Virginia Department of Transportation. A, uh, a number 100383, Shore Drive Corridor Improvements, Phase 4. B, uh, number 100160, Elbow <coughs> Road Extended, Phase 2D. Item C, number 100548, Pungo Ferry Road Improvements. Item D, number 100278, Nemo Parkway, Phase 7B. Item five is a resolution to support the city's 2021 applications for the Virginia Department of Transportation uh, Transportation Alternative Set Aside Program for fiscal year two, uh, fiscal year 2022, 23, and fiscal year 23 and 24. <coughs> Item six, a resolution to authorize a contract between the Virginia Beach Community Services Board and the Commonwealth of Virginia, Ray Mental Health Developmental and Substance Use Disorder Services. Item seven, 
resolution to authorize increased contributions to the Department of the Army, Ray Rudy Inlet Maintenance Dredging. Item 8, ordinances to extend the date for satisfying conditions <coughs> for the closing and improved portion right away adjacent to two residential properties located on the south side of 75th Street and west of Atlantic Avenue, A, 204A and 204B, 75th Street and 202, 75th Street, and B, 7406 Atlantic Avenue. Item 9, ordinances to extend the date for satisfying the conditions for a closing portions of unimproved rights away adjacent to 13 residential properties located along 75th and 76th Street and the west and west of Atlantic Avenue. A, 217 75th Street, B, 215A and 215B, 75th Street, C, 213 75th Street, D, 211 75th Street, <laughs> E, 209 75th Street, F, 205 75th Street, G, 203 75th Street, H, 218A and 218B, 76th Street, I, 216A and 216B, 76th Street, J, 214 76th Street, K, 210 76th Street, L, 208A and 208B, 76th Street, and M, 7500 Atlantic Avenue. Item 10, which is an ordinance to extend the date to satisfy conditions, rate closing a 10,645 <coughs> square foot portion of right of way known as Lord Dunmore Drive. Item 11, an ordinance to authorize temporary encroachments into a portion of the city-owned property known as Lake Wesley, located at the rear of 525 Dare Drive, Ray construct and maintain an existing pier with a roof structure, boat lift, and floating dock. Item 12, ordinances to accept and appropriate from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, to fiscal year 2021-22, <coughs> Fire Department Operating Budget, A, $979,704, rate continued operations and equipment requirements of Virginia Task Force II Urban Search and Rescue Team, and B, $2,128,970.41, rate the Champlain tower co collapse in Surfside, Florida on $54,869.11 Ray reimbursed for administrative cost <laughs> of preparing the reimbursement claims. Item 13, ordinances to accept and appropriate a uh, $14,097.28 from the Virginia Department of Health, the fiscal year for 2021-22 emergency medical services operating budget, race support rescue squad operations and training. Please note, note that uh, Madam Clerk, that Mr. Moss is voting no on that item or, or is abstaining, abstaining. on it on that item. Yes, sir. Item B, <coughs> uh, which is $35,291 from Dominion Energy Services, Inc. to fiscal year 2021-22 Parks and Recreation, operating budget rate plant trees to increase the urban tree canopy in accordance with the city's urban uh, forest management plan. Item C, $65,000 from the Virginia Supreme Court Drug Treatment Court Docket Grant to the fiscal year 2021-22. Commonwealth's Attorney's Operating Budget, Ray Expenses Related to Drug Treatment and Authorized 25% In-Kind Grant Match. 
D, $95,494 from the Commonwealth to fiscal year 2021. Clerk of the Circuit Court operating budget rate provide compensation supplements for employees. And E, $274,824 from the Commonwealth in aid to local localities grant funding to fiscal year 2021-22 <coughs> fire department operating budget for a personal protective equipment training and uniforms. Item 14, ordinances to accept and appropriate from the Department of Motor Vehicles, DMV, to the fiscal year 2021-22 Police Department operating budget and authorize 50% in-kind match. A, $29,400 ray overtime related to the enforcement of seat belt laws. B, $36,200 ray overtime related to the enforcement of DUI laws. And C, $77,503 Ray overtime and equipment related expenses to speed enforcement. I open a public hearing on planning. On the planning for consent, item K1, the application of Jeffrey and Paige Madrigal for the street closure, Ray 334 square feet portion of unimproved right of way adjacent to the rear of 317 45th Street. District 6, Beach, deferred from November 19, 2019. Two, the application of Elias Properties, Virginia Beach Independence, LLC, for conditional change of zoning from conditional B1 neighborhood business to conditional B2 community business, reoperate a commercial retail store at 2749 South Independence Boulevard <clears throat> district 1, Centerville District, deferred from September the 7th, 2021. Uh, item 6, application of Jarrett Simmons, Jarrett Simmons and Marlena Begley Simmons for a conditional use permit for alternative resident development Ray 2841 West Gibbs Road, District 7, Princess Anne. Item 7, no, item, excuse me. Yeah, I think you missed five. All right. Okay, you just want to say no. Okay, item 4, application. Are there speakers on that? No, five. 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 There are no, there are no, five number five is the one for consent agenda. The Mayflower. Okay, item five, VTS Lynn Mayflower Owner LLC for a conditional use permit or a short-term rental at 205 34th Street, A, Unit 1601, uh, B, Unit 1602, C, Unit 1603, D, Unit 1604, uh, E, Unit 1605, in the Beach District, noting that Mr. Moss and Ms. Henley are voting no. Item 6, the application of Jarrett Simmons, Jarrett Simmons and Marlena Begley Simmons, Ray, for a conditional use <coughs> permit for additional resident development, Ray 2841. West Gibbs Road, District District 7, Princess Anne. Second. You have a motion so and, moved. and a second. Any discussion? Uh, the, I would just say that I had uh, indicated to uh, uh, to pull item three, but I believe economic development said that they would give us a markup of the changes so we could just defer that one. If okay, it's, defer? If it, okay. Yes, we can defer three. So we have a consent for deferral on item three. Yeah, Mr. Moss. I just want to make one amp <coughs> amplification on item three because I've got a lot of emails and I suspect some of you have as well that misunderstand this Community Development Corporation Authority. Uh, just to put everyone's mind at ease, this Community Development Authority's jurisdiction does not ex exceed beyond the physical parameters of the dome site itself. And the City Council and the Community Development 
authority board are one in the same, so we're not appointing someone else, and you have the ability to reach out and touch us at the polls if you don't think we're doing a good job, but it has no authority to tax, levy a fee, or any such regulation outside the physical parameters of the dome site held by a private developer. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank Mayor. you. <coughs> okay, sorry, motion Mayor. in a second. I, I, need, I need just to clarify something. So number planning number three, you're going to defer yeah. to a date certain to the uh, next meeting? Our next meeting will be fine. Okay, thank you. I just needed clarification. So okay, thank you. And that will be consent. Mm -hmm. September 21st. Okay. okay. Uh, vote is open. By a vote of 10 to 0, you've read the consent agenda as read by Council Member Jones, noting nay votes by Ms. Henley, Mr. Moss, and um, Mr. Moss's abstention. Can I explain that? Okay, yep, yeah, Mr. Moss. I just wanted to explain my abstention to the public. Uh, I have a letter on file. Uh, I have a personal interest in Dominion Energy that exceeds the dividend threshold under state law of $5,000, and therefore I'm obligated by state statute to abstain from any issues dealing with Dominion Energy. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Mr. Moss. Okay, going back to ordinances and resolution, item number two, resolution to make certain commitments regarding comprehensive flood mitigation <coughs> bond referendum re uh, requested by Council Member Moss and Tower. First speaker is Barbara Messner, and after Ms. Messner is um, Ronna Marsh. I have a question on uh, one of these that you deferred. I think that was one that was pulled, if, the, if I'm not mistaken. So we're still allowed to speak if something's, even if it's deferred, we're still allowed to speak. If that was the corporate landing one. Okay, so um, if you'll repeat that one. It's, which this one? is number two. Okay, one, okay, the bond. Okay. Um, comprehensive flood mitigation. I think you'll all get an F for flood mitigation, especially after uh, Hurricane Matthew. Done nothing. Some of the FEMA money went to 16th Street uh, by the breakers. Okay, this is, I believe it's around 568 million new debt to fix things that y'all have ignored for decades. The referendums are non-binding. This is long-term debt. If people look at, I think it's page seven on the last meeting uh, on informal. It, it shows, you know, when you're gonna work on these. Some of them are 95 year plans. And even discussions of, uh, you know, raising roads above the flood water. All of the retention ponds are just flood water that you're putting in a little pond and holding it. And like at the sports center, all those huge bodies of water and by the brewery. I think the brewery was the one at Corporate Landing that I did sign up to speak on. Because that's, you know they're applying for it. Uh, the Economic Development Authority is applying for it for New Realm Green Flash, and we already gave them $750 million grant. Okay. Um, Non-binding referendum, total malfeasance that we have sinkholes, <coughs> that we have, um, <clears throat> you know, we still have flooding. You keep building and building and building uh, you tear down, I think it's a square mile of woods uh, for the sports center. And that was 78 million from the arena deal that didn't go through, that kept in the budget and let it get transferred. Um, to the sports center, which is public, private education money, school money. Okay, the, the light's flashing, Amanda. Is that the only one I'm speaking on right now? Okay, thank you. Mrs. Marsh. Welcome, Rona. Good evening. And then Virginia, sorry, and then Virginia thank Wasserberg. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate all you are doing, and I want to commend our city clerk, Amanda <laughs> Barnes, and her staff for making it so easy to come and speak to you. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here and to be able to speak 
and have this opportunity. I am very much in favor, strongly in favor, of the flood mitigation spending. I think anyone who doesn't jump on this and realize that for $14 a month, it's a bargain. And we need the money. We need the $567 million. Mr. Dehaney has worked very hard on the budget. He's trying to craft it and make it as squeaky as he can. And he has a great uh, finance uh, person, uh, Ms. Shelton. But we need this money because I don't see it coming out of the $2.2 billion that we already are getting every year. So I am going to encourage people to vote for this. I encourage you to get it on the ballot for citizens to vote for it, because I really want to know if we have made any progress in our funding of our pension liabilities. You all have an email that you got from me within the last 30 minutes asking if that pension <laughs> liability, which I was told here three years ago, was going to be paid down in 25 years. Many people promised 25 years it will be paid off. I saw some numbers Ms. Shelton provided. It doesn't look like the trend is going down. It looks like the trend is going up. And the chart that Mr. Moss got that went back to 2002, when we only had 25 million in surplus, still looks to be hundreds of millions in arrears. So I would really like to see some disclosure on our finance page showing what's happening to our unfunded pension liabilities. And I'd love to see this bond happen, because I am a uh, active member with Stop the Flooding Now, and we do believe that we need the money and let the citizens vote. And if they don't vote for this and they spend more money at Starbucks, it's their own fault if they float down Rosemont Road. So please put it on the ballot. I <laughs> really encourage you to do Appreciate that. Appreciate it. Thank you. Did, did you Mr. Mayor, can I yes. ask a question? Ms. Marsh, I just wanted to let you know your message is not loading on my phone. Maybe it's just me, but if maybe uh, I just wanted to make sure. I'll send it to you again, Mr. Resend Power. It, yeah. if, any, if anybody else got, doesn't I get got, my messages. I got the heading. I just. just okay. Well, I can Mrs. send Marsh, it again. I received it on my desk, my laptop, and it came through. It came through okay. Okay. So you okay. Want to check well, it I just. It had some charts on it. I that was very kind through. to get some charts uh, from Mr. Dehaney and Mr. Moss's charts, and I thought they were helpful because I think people understand charts better. So if we could put some <coughs> charts on DBGov Finance, that would be great. Thank you all so much. And again, thank you, Amanda, for all your great. Virginia Wasserberg, and then Teresa Langle. Hey, Virginia, good, good evening. Hi, good evening. Um, so uh, I want to say to you all this evening, Shana Tova. We are in um, a time that my family celebrates the Jewish high holidays. It's called Rosh Hashanah, and we're leading up to Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. And in Rosh Hashanah, what we do in our family is we take a time to take a step back and look at the things that we've done and reflect on them and learn how to improve as we go forward in the future. And that's what the Day of Atonement is for in Yom Kippur. In saying that, I look at this resolution that Mr. Moss has written and Mr. Towers put his name on, too. And I think you probably helped out with it too. <laughs> Sorry, not to say, just put your name on it. <laughs> but I look at it, <laughs> I look at it as a step forward. I look at it as an improvement as to where we've been and where we're going. And I think it is a great improvement. You know, I'm standing here a month away from the five year anniversary of when my house on South Plaza Trail and Old Forge Road flooded. And I know that it flooded because projects weren't funded because there were other priorities that, were, that the council saw fit. But that's not the same council that's in front of me now. Some of you are, were on there, but it's a different body. You guys are a different body, and you have a different vision, and you have a different way forward. And I know that Mr. Moss has said this, and it's true, is that if you read through the resolution, he has taken everything from the past, asks that I've had, asks that other people have had, and he's taken those things from the past and he's tightened them up along with our city staff and our city manager and they've done a great job it is a good solid resolution and i would not stand here as a republican and a tea partier and ask for a tax increase if i didn't know that it wasn't responsible and that's what's before you in this resolution is a responsible way of increasing taxes like 
Rana just said, $14, $15 a month, but a responsible way forward. Because I've heard a lot of people say, a lot of people around me in the circles that I'm in politically, they say, you guys didn't do your job. You didn't do your job before. So why should I trust you? Well, I say I trust you because you're not the same people you were five years ago. And this city staff has done a really good job at moving us forward. And this resolution is going to move us even further forward in a positive manner. So thank you for it. And I hope that you pass it. Thank you. Thank you. Teresa Langlow <coughs> and then Robert Dane. Good evening. Hi, I'm Rebecca. Um, obviously, they said my name already, and I'm here to speak on behalf of my husband and I. We went over the referendum that John um, presented to us at a meeting and did a very good job. And I might say that I really appreciate our new city manager. I met you about half a year ago or something. I really like him makes you feel welcome to speak to him. Um, I'm like Virginia and Rona. I really think this is a really great plan. Nobody is ever against spending taxes. And But like so many out here, there's like a trust issue with government, especially in the last year from the federal government down over at the school board, everywhere. And that's the one thing about the plan that I really appreciated was the fact that it addressed transparency really well by, um, by having a citizen council where you could be informed of what's going on, a web page where you can look up and see what's there, by um, just that, that you have taken the time to address that in it. Because that is one of the things why government becomes stagnant is when they lose trust. I think that was addressed in this. I really like that. I had a little question a little bit about the fact that we weren't going to have any um, increase in storm water charges until, what, 2008? I'd like to know what that's going to be when 2008 passes. Is it going to be one, one, uh, one cent? five cents, 10 cents, 20 cents. And um, that's it. I think it's a really good plan. And I wanted to say that, like so many of you up here, and like my husband and I, when we're sitting here considering this, we're thinking about what people are paying 20 years down the road when we're either not here or we've moved or whatever. A lot of young people that are just starting to buy houses, I don't want them flooding <laughs> like we did. My house flooded. And immediately, I spent $11,000 right off the top to disinfect it and, and begin that process. So I think that, um, like they were saying, I think it's on a $300,000 home, maybe $14, $15 to have this taken care of as a long-term project so that those that own homes that are children now, that they don't have this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Robert Dean. And after Mr. Dean, we'll have a speaker via WebEx, Diana Howard. Welcome, Robert. Good evening. <clears throat> I just uh, had an anniversary 41 years ago. I moved into my home on September, September 1st. And just about two years ago, we had all of our canals in Green Run dredged after 50 years of never being dredged. And I want to thank Mr. Moss because during Matthew, I borrowed a uh, generator from him because all of our neighborhoods, the, the electricity was out because the water rose so high. It came up into the transformers, blew the transformers up, and uh, Virginia Power had to come down from Richmond with gigantic cranes lifting them over homes to replace the, uh, the transformers. So it wasn't fun. But I also remember sitting here uh, uh, 28 years ago when we had the stormwater fee. And I know Councilman Moss and a couple of others, I think Nancy Parker and myself, uh, voted to make it a tax and not a fee. 
because that way the homeowner could be tied into their real estate taxes and they could deduct it. Well, we didn't have the votes. So all these years, these uh, 29 years now, we've been paying this stormwater fee. And now we're going to continue to pay it. So the problem I have was with these bond issues, we heard the same rhetoric when it was on the late rail. Oh, yeah, we need to issue these bonds now because the interest rates are so low. But designs, everything wasn't even going to be done for another 10 years. And nobody knew what those, real, those, uh, what those bond issue taxes were going to be at that time. Same thing here. We don't have any shovel-ready projects that if you start tomorrow and you issue the bonds at whatever current rate is, under 2 two maybe 3%, depending on with our bond rating, they're not going to start now. So this is a whole facade that is somewhat disingenuous to the general public. I usually support just about everything Councilman Moss uh, puts forth because he's very diligent. He is incredible, absolutely incredible. But in this case, he has not convinced me that we can trust the city staff based on all the past performances when uh, so many of their projects have failed. And now we, the taxpayers, are paying for them. So my recommendation would be that everything that's being done is done by an outside engineering firm with performance bonds attached to them. And you don't let go of the performance bonds like we originally, we recently did with the Sandler project uh, until we've seen the performance is done. Because you cannot come back and you cannot call a performance bond on our city manager or any of the staff. We need to do a better job of engineering and outsourcing. We just don't have any recourse. And that's another reason why I'm, I'm really opposed to this project, because uh, you haven't proven the case. But we'll see what the public does Thank between now much. and uh, November. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Before you leave, yes. because I always do this, I always like to recognize people that have served on this body in the past and thank them for their past service. But Robert served from 1992 through 1996, and I just want to acknowledge his service to the community, even though we disagree. Thank oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and for our new city manager, we'll see what the Cleveland Browns do against the Steelers this year. <laughs> <laughs> so the, 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 the last speaker is via WebEx, Diana Howard. Ms. Howard, if you'll pause two to three seconds before we begin, you're unmuted. Oh, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the city council, um, and John Moss, city manager, Patrick Duhaney, and the rest of the city staff that came to our meeting last week to talk about the referendum and the resolution that you're voting on tonight. When Matthew happened, it was the perfect storm, a hundred year event, you called it. Nothing would have prevented it. The ground was saturated when it hit. The water had nowhere to go. A lot of our problems are not caused by climate change or sea level rise. To do the systems that cannot handle the increased development, pipes that are too small to handle the capacity, aging infrastructure and the backlog and maintenance. The referen referendum asked to fund 567 million in debt capacity for 21 phase one projects to be paid for by real estate tax increases that you're not telling us how much that increase is because you don't know because it depends on the interest rates and whether it's cheaper for a 10 year bond or a 20 year bond. The resolution is to ensure that the revenue from those taxes are put in a sort of lockbox and to prevent future development from exceeding the capacity that's created and to create a citizen oversight committee and for transparency. But once the debt is retired from the phase one projects, they can issue more bonds without a referendum because we've created that debt capacity. So we'll go on to phase two and phase three and the tax will never go away. But if the economy improves, they told us, above 3% a year, above the amount needed to pay off the bonds, council can vote to lower that rate. Council has a past record of raising taxes and fees for needs while spending on wants. 
nothing in your resolution also is decreasing the size and scope of city government, which continues to grow year after year. And you'll raise our taxes for that as well. Also, when you go on to the phase two projects, you said you might even raise taxes again for that, even though you, you know, you don't have to ask for another referendum. You brought up drains, not trains. Remember us, we, when you raised our real estate taxes, four cents, way before the light rail referendum killing it, we advocated after the, it, would, it was dead to have those taxes diverted to stormwater, yet you only moved one cent of it, right? Use the rest of it for your priorities. So why should we trust you? We appreciate that during the pandemic. Speaker, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Moss, would you like to make a motion? And then when, after a second, we can have a discussion. Sure. But I have a few remarks I'd like to make if that would be appropriate. Sure. I would move the adoption of the resolution. First of all, I, I even though these are words that, you know, the guy and I worked on, I think all of you would, all my council, fellow council members would look in here and see words that they <coughs> recognize and comments that we have all talked about around the table. So I don't take any singular authorship for the words, only for doing the homework of putting everybody's on this diocese thoughts and responding to the questions that all of us and all the concerns we've heard from constituents out in the city. It is a path that we took back in 1986 when we had a very successful bond referendum for roads, schools, rec centers, many people may recall that I know Ms. Henley does. And I basically borrowed a lot from the past because I think it does get us to the trust point. Um, I have spent many hours with my good friend, the city manager, and Kevin Chantelier in the uh, budget department um, looking at the foundational documents of looking at our existing tax base at $67 billion roughly, <coughs> assuming that it would grow at 3% annually so we could look at this over a 20-year 20, uh, 20 life cycle. Um, the bond referendum is mandatory. The bond referendum is obliges any future council can only expend those resources on those named projects no matter who sits here in the future. Um, we didn't just tell you it costs this much to put the stuff in place. This also includes the total life cycle cost, done on a 20 year basis, even though some of these pipes would last longer, but you can only see so far into the future, I think, and, be, and be, think you're being credible. But it includes operation and maintenance. It includes the renovation, and also includes depreciation expense, along with debt service. Uh, we currently are issuing our 20-year debt at under 2% because the treasury 10-year treasury note really runs around 1.2 to 1.3, and we're usually 25 to 40 basis points over that for GOB bonds. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office is forecasting that that favorable because of monetary, loose monetary policy by the feds probably will last through 23, but probably we won't exceed 3% to be till 25. So I think it's fair to say that if you could get 2% loan, you'd probably take a 15-year mortgage. But if the interest rates are 7%, you're going to take that 20- or 30-year mortgage. Well, we're, we're exercising the same common sense here. So when you see a range, the range is relative to that we're going to do the smart thing. Now, obviously, you can say, well, how can we be sure? Well, you can never be sure about anything, even, you know, in life. But all I can tell you is a representation of we're building it on that basis. And this resolution is designed to put I guess, public firewalls that you can hold us accountable for achieving. The other concern is that we don't have shovel-ready projects. Well, that's not exactly true. One of the things about all this, and obviously we have other cash sources of revenue with the American Rescue Plan and also with the federal funds to come with their infrastructure bill when that finally clears probably next year, we can put cash into accelerating maintenance. But we can move on the Plaza Lakes and a Windsor Wood project that's a $329 million project that under the current process we're on, that's 15 plus, maybe 20 years in the future to complete. Under this, we can do that in 10 years. That is among some of the most affordable housing in our community. Many of those places are not on the preferred flood risk plan for FEMA. 
And some of those people look at three twenty-seven hundred dollars. I know Virginia can speak to that flood insurance that you have to make at a lump sum payment. Well, guess what? Many of those people don't have that lump sum payment, and because of their situation, they're at great risk. I wish we could make it happen in five years, but there is the reality of takes to move dirt. So flooding is a serious threat. And for those who say it's not changed, most people do not know that all of our city that was developed before 1980 was built to a one or two year flood standard. One or two year flood standard, not the 10 we've built since then, but none of those were built to accommodate in a discharge fashion the current intense rainfalls and the frequencies for which they are falling and forecasted to continue. So you could be up in New Jersey where I listened on NPR radio and she said, you know what, our coastal defenses really work. That's the money they got from Sandy. She said, but our streets couldn't handle the discharges and our whole neighborhoods flooded. Well, that's what we face. Our current system, even if maintained to its design capacity, and that's what we're going to do in 10 years, get that fixed won't handle the discharge water. You're still going to get flooded. If your home is at the same level of the street, which it is in many of our communities, your chance of flooding your structure is not being abated by just making the current system work. This really is a serious threat that our community faces and communities that face it head on, I'd much rather prefer to prevent flooding than to pay the $11,000 cost to, to get the water and clean up after the flood. This is a small price, it is an increase, but it's a value proposition, but the threat is real. So either you pay me now or you pay me later. And we've done a number of things to help that. People also talked about, yeah, but you, you build the roads, you do this, do this, and then you just rezone the capacity away. I'm not gonna deny that this, people who sat here over time have done it. Town centers are a prime example. But I can't, I don't have a time machine and I'm not willing to let my house flood just because I don't like what happened. That's just a sunk cost. And I don't want my house to flood or anybody else's home to flood for that matter. So one of the things that's in here that when we start our comp plan, I know Mr. Tahan's right here, it's going to be constrained by the discharge capacity of this plan. But this plan isn't 10 years, this plan isn't 20 years. This probably is t in total to get us just to 2050 is probably a 25 year investment to get everything done. And that's just to address changing rainfall and to change a foot and a half of sea level rise, which we've already experienced about eight inches of that already. So this is, I'm a, just a science person. I don't, I don't know what might have caused it, but I know the measurements are the measurements and I can see the effects. And I think all of us know somebody whose home has flooded I'll never forget talking to the police officer after Matthew, who said he heard his daughter, and I remember, Virginia might remember this story, he said he heard his daughter screaming in his bedroom, and he's thinking, what in the world's going on? That was an exact expression. But then he said he put his feet down, and we're all in water, and the water was only a couple inches from the top of his mattress, so he hadn't felt the water yet. Or when it rains real hard, kids ask their parents, is our house gonna flood again? I mean, those are real experiences in our community, and I think we have an obligation when we can for a modest price to make that go away. And then someone talked about the acquisition. I think one of the great things about our city manager, there's lots of things about, great about Patrick, <laughs> city manager, is when he was in Cincinnati, they had a community that had their stormwater and their sewer system all in one piping system. Sounds like you're in London in the 1880s, right? Well, clearly they're under a consent decree that they had to have two separate systems built throughout their whole city. And I don't know if they got 30 years or whatever, but they got some period of time to get that done in, but you're talking six, eight billion dollars, and Patrick was the manager of that effort. So I know we have someone who knows that you don't do that stuff with organic talent. You go out and you do hire it, and in this, this resolution talks about that acquisition strategy. You're gonna be able to bid on by watershed, or someone can come in and bid to do the whole thing, it does talk about having a separate qualified quality assurance company that's also bonded. <coughs> We've had that experience in the past. I know Mrs. Henley knows when we hired the Serdrip Corporation to do quality acceptance on our roads. They did such a great job that the special interest wanted us to get rid of them, and then we did. Uh, but uh, I think that we've addressed that, and I don't know many people realize that come this October, you're gonna be seeing new FEMA rates 
for flood insurance based on a whole new set of criteria and based on congressional direction, they are required over the next five years to make the FEMA flood account actuarially sound. That means big increases. I think they're going to go back to the base year of 2016 for a 25% increase on average and then increasing them thereafter to make that actuarial sound. So it really does pay off to be in a preferred risk category, which is where we will get, we will add 8% of our land to this. And the last point I'll make, because there's a lot of things I could say, Mr. Mayor, you can tell I'm passionate about this and have done my homework studying this for the last several years, that if we had a 100-year event storm based on the NOAA model, model 14, I believe it's called, today, 161 miles of our 257 square miles, which is 63%, would flood if it happened at high tide. Now, I don't know how many of you can visualize what that would look like, but I look on TV and I see some of these places and say, I only hope we can do it faster than 10 years would be my hope. Probably not. But I have confidence, and I'm glad to hear, and I appreciate the comments even from my good colleague, Robert, skepticism is always healthy, and I always applaud that. But I do my homework. I think that's my reputation. And, and I do believe we have the right talent, we have the right counsel, and we can really stand out and be ahead of the curve. That's a phrase used by another body. But truly be ahead of the curve and maintain the value of people's most important asset, their home but more importantly, maintain the ability of our city to economically grow, because if we think we can do nothing that the bond rating agencies are just gonna overlook our vulnerability, and if we think people looking to bring jobs to an area are just gonna overlook our vulnerability, they are not. So this is a, to me, a win-win for a small price over time, and I, and I highly recommend its adoption, but really the credit is not just to Mr. Tower and myself, really these words represent the public's feedback and the comments of my colleagues over time, I just had the privilege of putting them in a couple syntax and getting some help from the manager about what really was possible versus my ambition. So he <laughs> tempered that. But I highly recommend it and would recommend its adoption. Okay, we have a motion. We have a second? Second. Okay, we have a second. And then uh, comment, Ms. Wilson. First of all, I'm really happy that I had the opportunity to vote on this. And I, I thank Councilman's Tower and Moss for putting it together. Um, it's, it's a really scary time when you, when you watch the television this weekend and you saw what Ida did to these communities of Louisiana, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York. I mean, New York, the people in their basements were, were drowning. Um, this is not a want, it's definitely a need. And those communities could have been us because they received 10 inches of rain in three hours and there was no place for the water to go. And we could be in the same place. And if we don't do this, we could be facing these same issues. And we need, to, I mean, look what happened with Matthew that uh, Virginia spoke so eloquently about. There was no place for the water to go. There have been two major rainstorms. The, the ground was saturated. And we've seen also, besides um, the flooding, what happens to the trees when the ground gets saturated. So anyway, I'm, I'm very happy to support this. And I hope that uh, the citizens will realize when they go to, the, to, to vote, this is a vote for their future. This is to keep us from drowning as a city. And you look at our, our military bases, the military is not going to stay here if they can't drive to get to work, if their roads are flooded. And the other companies, it's, it's, we're going to be in a really hard place. So we will be in a very diminished capacity as a community. And your, your home values will go down. Uh, your children are not going to want to come back here to work. I mean, there's so many implications to this. So anyway, I'm very happy to vote for this. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Henley? Well, uh, again, <clears throat> I appreciate that uh, John was a scribe, as he described himself, to, to write down the things that we had talked about. But I, I think the real critical thing that makes it different this time is that we've done our homework. And over the past five years, we have done the extensive analysis that has brought us to the place 
and as it says here in this uh, resolution, that uh, we have studied and modeled the four watersheds. What other city has got <laughs> different watersheds as we have uh, with the Chesapeake and the, and the southern watersheds, and they have entirely different things, plus the 15 drainage basins that have validated the drainage capacity required to discharge the water and so forth and so forth. And I think the thing that's really important for everyone to understand is that we, we have done the homework, we have got the science, they have looked at so many things, and if anybody hasn't read those studies, uh, I think reading them will see that, that we are in a position now to say, this is the path. It's, it's not something that we're gonna get to in this 10 years, but it's the beginning. And if we don't begin now, we'll never get there. It's really gonna be a continuous path. But this is the path that we can follow and we will be working on getting to that that stage where we would be able to uh, address the sea level rise as well as the stormwater issues. And I think too it's really important and, 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 and John has included it in here that it's, it's important that people don't just look at those 21 projects and say this is it. That's one component. That's what we need this additional bonding rate, this bonding authority to be able to do is those 21 projects. But as a part of this overall plan, we're going to be um, eliminating the backlog and maintenance of legacy ponds, ditches, and canals. And, and it's that backlog that has been so uh, onerous that we've just not been able to keep up with the system. But by having the additional bonding authority to do these projects, it would free up the other money that we're then going to be able to use to make sure that we're getting the maintenance done on the rest of our system. So I hope people won't get <coughs> bogged down into just looking at those projects and saying, well, I don't see anything here that's in my neighborhood. That's just one component of the overall plan. And we did talk about a lot of the things that, that we found uh, in the 80s, and Nancy Parker was a part of that as well, to find out what the people really in, insisted uh, that we have in a bond referendum in order to make them comfortable in voting for it. And this oversight uh, group uh, was one of the things that we used and, and, and found that it gave people the confidence to know that we were doing what we said we were going to do, the lockbox. These things that are all enumerating now in this resolution to assure the people that this is what we're going to do. Uh, and and I, I, I know this is kind of lengthy uh, for people to read, but it's very important as well as tying in what we do with our comprehensive plan and what we do uh, with development going forward so that we don't erode what we have, have improved. So there's a lot here in this resolution, but I think what it does is it spells out what we are committing to do if we get the approval of, of the uh, public to do this bond referendum. But it also says, but if we don't get approval, this is what plan B is, what the fallback is. And what that means is it's gonna just take a lot longer. Uh, and, and I think it's also important that we're not promising that you're not gonna have any puddles when it rains. We can't do that, <coughs> but we're going to certainly be having as our primary goal that you're not gonna have your house to flood. Uh, and and I, I hope people will take the time to read these things and, and see how we, how we expect to do it, not just why we're doing it, but how we expect to do the entire project. And it's not just 21 projects, it's the whole spectrum. And, and I really appreciate uh, the, the effort that uh, John and, and, and Guy went to, to to put it down in, in writing so that you all can be uh, comfortable in knowing how it's going to be done. Okay, thank you. Mr. Tower. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just want to add my voice to um, uh, salute this resolution. It's certainly, I think uh, one of the most important things has been in front of me since I've been on council. And I'm happy to have my name on it. I'm somewhat embarrassed because John Moss did literally all of the work, but I wanted to salute that work by putting my name on it to say this 
is important. This is, these are answers to questions that I asked about what's going to happen, uh, what are we getting for this, and what are we going to, where, where are we going to be if we don't do this? And I urge people to read it. It's not that long, and it, every word in it is very well thought out. It's a great brief for the bond referendum. Whether you tend to agree, agree with it or not, that's not the issue. I think you'll be better educated about our city and about what our needs are. And I urge, I urge everyone to, uh, I urge my colleagues to vote yes, and I urge all of you to listen. Thank you, Ms. Henley, also for making a number of points that I won't repeat. Uh, I think you, she, Ms. Henley, more than anyone on this council probably has uh, a grip on where, where, where we've been and, and where we are now, and I thank her for her remarks as well. And I Anyone else at this point? If I could just say that um, you know, I really hope the public really develops a high deal of confidence. You know, we are a very good council that is really mission focused on that. We've established this as priorities for a long time. And yes, we have a city manager uh, and staff that are going to make us the city of yes and the city of can do. So with that being said, I not only enthusiastically endorse the um, ordinance that we're voting on, but I'm fully supporting the, the referendum and I will be very public about it. Thank you. At this point, the vote is open for approval. I have voted 10 to 0. You have approved the, the ordinance. Good. Yeah, John. Well, first of all, I want to thank the council as a whole and the public, but the significance of this is on Thursday night when I was talking, I had to talk about this in advocacy, and now that this is the council adopted policy, our public affairs office can put this out as fact and not uh, a proposed. And so now this can be part of our fact neutral. Uh, education mm -hmm. campaign so that is an added benefit but this really is a collective work of this whole body I can't reemphasize that enough I truly was just the scribe <laughs> yeah. and I think Mr. Moss and Ms. Henley I think the fact that it was the unanimous vote by this body is also very significant okay all right moving on to item ordinance number 15 ordinance to accept and appropriate from the Department of Homeland Security uh, fiscal year 21-22 fire department operating budget uh, 23,002 for the purchase of equipment related to response and recovery duties of the marine team and uh, $368,119 and transfer 36-8-1191 cash match requirement from public safety equipment uh, project CIP number 100325 ray physical fitness programs and training we have one speaker barbara messner oh, sorry. <coughs> 15. I, I, ordinance 15. <coughs> Okay. Um, yeah, I thought I thought we went over this, but um, accept and appropriate from Department of Homeland Security um, for twenty one twenty two fire department operating budget um, thirty three thousand to purchase equipment related to response and recovery for Marine Team. Um, And 368,000 uh, plus transfer cash match uh, requirement from public safety um, for CIP 1325 rate physical fitness programs and training. Um, it's just federal money for the city. The city doesn't take care of what they should. And 
you know, the vote on the bond referendum and having all your friends come here, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's shameful. Yeah, Mr. Moss. I brought this to council's attention not because I disagree with the requirement, and the, and the matching money is relatively insignificant at 36000 but what caused my concern, you know, my, I look at everything, that's, I'm just a detailed person, so I went back to read the language, because, and I know in the future they'll be included, but the CIP page was not included when we got this. So if you go back and read the description and scope that we voted on and adopted, which is controlling on the staff, the last sentence on page 132 of the CIP reads, quote, the scope of this project is to replace existing equipment and should not be in to include the purchase of additional vehicles, boats, or other similar capital items. Now, that doesn't mean that this body can't override its own guidance, but if you read the agenda packet that we got, you would never know that we had guidance and that using this money for this purpose wasn't consistent with this guidance because this is establishing a new capability, number one. And I think that in all fairness that that should be disclosed and we should know what's happening. Further, I asked a lot of questions uh, on top of this, which I appreciate the prompt answer since Monday was a holiday, but it also had tuition and things of that nature when you say, well, why would we be using capital dollars for a consumable expense? That's not a long lasting item. Generally, you would be using operation and maintenance or operation money to pay for that. And literally, there is another source for that money, but you would never know that, once again, reading the council agenda that we got that was less than full disclosure. And so I think part of this discussion here is an instructive one to say that people are going to look at that stuff and someone's going to read that and they're going to send some of us an email saying, hey, how come you did this? And then we're going to say, well, I never knew. Well, because you have to go back and then read those documents. And also when you do look for it in the CIP, it's not under public safety, it's under buildings and equipment. Because when you read the first sentence of the CIP project item, which has $6.9 million in it, it says it's for public safety equipment and other equipment across the city. Well, the conjunctive means that the money appropriate in that CIP is not limited to public safety equipment. So the title of the CIP item, which I didn't pick up before, that's falls on me, but the scope is much larger than that. We don't get in our packet the amount of obligated to date, how much is left. And I, and I really do believe, as I shared with the city manager, that the source of funding should not have been from this CIP because of that language. And we should have been getting the money from somewhere else that was more in keeping because it said right here, we should not. Now, should's not shall. And then when I asked that question, the answer I got was, well, we're gonna reprogram the money from this account into another account that we can then use it for. Well, I think that's not the intent of that language. And all I'm asking for is going forward, that we get better full disclosure, that they include the actual CIP page, <coughs> that someone actually <laughs> maybe reads it would be good. And then if we're making a change to a policy that we've established in guidance, that that's brought to our full attention and that we are consciously doing so. But in this case, for $36,000, I don't know why we don't have that within the operating budget. So I'm not gonna move to approve it because I think this was not brought to us in the right way, but I don't disagree with the requirement. I do disagree in the manner in which it's being funded. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Is that it on the speakers? Yes, sir. Okay, do we have a motion? Move for approval. Motion for approval. Second. And second from Mr. Second. Jones. Any other discussion? Vote is open. Uh, Mayor, is this for A and B? Correct. For A and B. There isn't anybody else. It's fine. Open the vote. One second, we're open the vote. Mr. Mr. Berlucci, Mr. Tower, may I have your vote? Thank you. By a vote of eight to two, you report, approve the ordinance. Okay, thank you. Okay, we are now opening up and planning. And um, 
Okay, do we ha uh, we need to vote on uh, Mrs. Henley's number three? Yeah. We've heard that. Okay, we, uh, we, we already did that. Okay, we're up on number four at this point, and that is Samet Properties and Taylor Farms Land, <coughs> LLC, for conditional change of zoning from AG1 and AG2, agricultural conditional 1-1 uh, light industrial to uh, conditional L1 light industrial and conditional use permits to build storage yard uh, 20 97 Harpers Road and District 6. To, um, Eddie Bourdon for the applicant. Hey, welcome, Eddie. Thank you, <clears throat> Mayor Dyer, Vice Mayor Jones, Honorable Members of City Council, for the record, Eddie Bourdon, Virginia Beach Attorney representing Samet Properties, LLC, and Taylor Farms Land Company, LLC, and Ms. Linda Cha Taylor Chapel, who's the manager. Uh, Mr. Randy Royal with Kim Lee Horn will also be uh, presenting on um, our, our behalf, so I'll keep my comments brief, and I'm sure that'll make people plenty happy. Um, also with me uh, are Brian Hall and Hunter Nichols with Samet Properties, who've traveled here for the hearing this after this evening. Excuse me. Uh, the subject property um, is that's the subject of this conditional rezoning and conditional use permit application um, is 67.15 acres <laughs> on the east side of Harper's Road and north side of London Bridge Road, where this request will result in the um, development of a distribution center serving the city of Virginia Beach and its residents. The <coughs> site is located um, in an area that has been designated as, <coughs> in, as light industrial for light industrial development in our comprehensive plan for over 40 years. It's characterized as the special economic growth area number three, SEGA 3 South Oceana. And that has, again, been in our comprehensive plan for 40 plus years. The property is located in the greater than 75 DBN highest noise zone <coughs> around and in proximity to NAS Oceana. The property is also encumbered by an air installations compatible use zone easement, an ACUS easement, um, that was taken by the United States Department of the Navy over 40 years ago um, <coughs> for the purpose um, of restraining uses to those that are determined to be compatible with airfield operations under both our city's ordinances and those adopted by the city subsequent to um, <clears throat> the MOU entered into with the Department of the Navy after the BRAC. Um, these restrictive um, easements as well as our ordinances are all being complied with and the Navy has so opined with a letter that's in uh, the package that you all have. Uh, the, the project will involve a proffered site development plan, which you all have seen, uh, as well as a landscape plan for the site and <coughs> building elevations. The, there will be extensive right-of-way improvements done to Harper's Road. As a result of the, de this development, there will be hundreds, hundreds of new jobs created, uh, <coughs> and the applicant is not requesting any economic development grants or any funds whatsoever uh, from uh, the city tax coffers. 18.77 acres of this property were rezoned two years ago for light industrial for a data center of 170,000 square foot data center that did not come to fruition. <coughs> All of the conditions that have been recommended to you by your professional staff and a unanimous planning commission under the use permit are acceptable to us. Obviously, we have proffers that haven't changed. <coughs> it's for the use permit, which does still apply to the whole property. Uh, I would note, and Randy will speak to the fact that one of the gentlemen who's the, the gentleman who signed up to speak tonight asked for a, a dark skies condition be added at the planning commission. And after studying it and becoming familiar with it, along with staff doing the same, that condition has been added to the use permit. Uh, but I'll let Mr. Royal come up and. He's handled most of the, he handled the public information meeting and um, has been involved with this project since I came on later. So I'll let him hey. finish it up. Hey, thanks very much, Mr. Brown. the opportunity to, to, to speak and rebuttal if need be. Thank you. You got it. Mr. Royal. Good evening. Good evening, <coughs> Members of Council, for the record, Randy Royal, business address, Kimley Horn and Associates, 4520 Main Street, Virginia Beach. Uh, as Eddie said, I had met with the citizens out there. Actually, 
me back up. I worked on the data center before for NextVin, which never came to fruition. Uh, there were not organized civic leagues in the area, so we reached out to a couple of the civic leaders and via social media, they helped arrange the meetings for the NextVin project. Did the same thing here because, again, we didn't have organized civic leagues. Uh, we had a meeting on July 21st at the PA Rec Center. I had eight people show up from various neighborhoods and spoke with them. Main topics, stormwater and roadways. Stormwater, we took a hard look. We spent a lot of time with staff to accommodate not only the additional flow that we're creating from the site, but also flow that backed up from the systems around it. We studied all the way down to West Neck Creek. Staff says the stormwater is ready for approval when we come in with the final plan, but they did extensive review up front. So we're handling our water and water that backs up onto the site. From a traffic standpoint, this operation showed, well, it was a traffic study done, and it showed no impact on the intersection. All of the traffic is coming out Harper's Road. As Eddie mentioned, we've got extensive improvements on Harper's Road, which we all know is a very narrow road. But Harper's Road out to Dam Neck, not going the back way to Oceana. That's the way everybody is going out. <coughs> the traffic study showed no impact on the intersection, primarily because we have no traffic or very little traffic during the rush hours. No traffic comes in or goes out during the 7 to 9 a.m. peak hour traffic. Only a small amount of traffic happens in the afternoon. That's why we have very little impact on the traffic out there. Dam Neck Road itself is at like 50% capacity. It's got a lot of capacity. Uh, beyond that, Eddie spoke to the Navy restrictive easement and they've signed that. Uh, as he said, one of the speakers at Planning Commission, or the one speaker at Planning Commission mentioned the concern with the dark sky and too much lighting in there. So we've got everything directed down, but we have agreed to another stipulation that says we will use dark sky lighting fixtures for the project. And I think Eddie's covered everything else, so I'll stand by for questions. Any questions? Okay, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Next speaker is Barbara Messner, and after Ms. Messner is Stephen Johnston. Yes, I was one of the eight people, I think there were more than eight people that attended, and I found out from other neighbors because there were no signs for a neighborhood. I live in Red Wing. You know, this property, uh, Red Wing, uh, which Miss Henley knows, I brought this up since 2014, uh, Red Wing is closed. It's over 600 homes. And you closed the main stoplight there. You said it was because of traffic and crashes. We have more crashes, more traffic now. And this is all related. Dam Neck, General Booth. Um, it's ridiculous to say it doesn't won't affect traffic you know there's word this is Amazon whatever it is it's you know it's a huge facility and as far as Oceana I mean they've had it's not just high noise uh, corporate landing corporate landing elementary are there it's um, high jet noise and high it's jet crash as of 2012 when you had the Mayfair Muse crash there were, there were 25 major crashes, including fatalities from NES Oceana. It's a training, um, training and practice for people coming right out of flight school, and they go round and round. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I heard the comments about, you know, the lighting. You know, I, I did ask planning about the light ordinance, and the school board, you know, we still haven't found out, you know, the... There's a national lighting ordinance, and that should be in effect not just for this one project, but for the entire city. We have a major problem with, uh, with the type of LED lights on the street, and you know half of them don't work. We have pitch dark roads. Uh, Mr. Dehaney, you know I mentioned to you about you know the pitch dark roads. There's, they still exist. Nothing's been done. I know you're new. When they say we have a new council, the only one really new is Mr. Holcomb. The rest of y'all have been here several years. So I'm definitely opposed to this. We have nonstop 
uh, crashes speeding. I can hear speeding five blocks back and there's lots of crashes on damn naked. Um, air roads aren't holding up because of all these uh, travel trailers and all these trucks on the road. Um, anyway, I'll let the next speakers speak, but you know, when, when they say it's bringing jobs, You know, that's what Economic Development Authority uses, and we don't know if they're going to ask for economic development grants. And, you know, no taxes on their equipment, just like the brewery. There's no taxes on the breweries. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, we don't have enough police. Our firemen are overworked, stretched, uh, crashes all the time at different hours. So the last thing we need is uh, another major thing on Damneck, because you already approved um, Spark Q GTS Global on Birdneck. There's two schools there and the police training center. And these, these roads are horrible. Um, I usually go around Oceana because most of the lights are out and, it, and there's no shoulders on the road. And it still hasn't been still hasn't been repaid. Parts of it have been repaid, but not all of it. Thank you. Stephen Johnston. Welcome. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I'm personally not opposed to the project. Most of the people in our neighborhood that I spoke with are not opposed to the project. I know he said there are going to be a couple hundred jobs. It's probably somewhere closer to 800 to 1,000 people will be working this facility. And the more jobs we have in Virginia Beach, the better. But what we're concerned is, how is this development going to affect our community? And what we want to do is try and minimize the impact from that. I work at a local engineering company. I do site lighting every month. I didn't think my requests were unreasonable. A uh, 25-foot mounting height for a pole. That's as large. That's as tall as the street lights here in Virginia Beach. Um, they indicated that there's that the standard for the developer is 40-foot pole. That's going to put the light fixtures on the poles near the top to the trees, so the light will bleed through the top of the trees and through the, through the community. Even though they're dark skies, the higher they go up, the more they spread out. We ask that they be able to turn the lights down at, at, after hours. We've got two large sections of parking, van storage area and van storage area. There's no reason for them to be lit up in the middle of the night if they're not driving the vans and people aren't walking through it, getting in and out of them. They can reduce the lighting level, reducing the haze that's going to be generated from that. I can stand in my backyard. I can see the lights at Lansdowne, and I can see the lights at Strawbridge. This is the only dark section I have right now in my backyard. My house backs up to Damneck Road on Damneck <clears throat> and London Bridge. Our main traffic concern is not what's happening on Harper's Road. That's the only place they did their traffic study on. Our main concern is the intersection of London Bridge Road and Damneck. 37,000 cars pass through that intersection every day. And now we're going to add another 1,000. One of the main complaints from Oceana is that there's too much traffic between Oceana and Damneck, and they're having too much problems getting people in and out of that. Well, the Damneck London Bridge intersection it leads directly to the back gate of NAS Oceana. And now we're going to clog that intersection up even more. This is a 24 hour facility. Their intention. What they've said in the past is that they're going to have semi-trucks delivering stuff to their plant in the middle of the night and loading up the vans and leaving. It's those semi-trucks in the middle of the night is going to cause a lot of noise. I won't be able to sleep with my windows open anymore. The city did promise us sound mitigation between our houses and Damneck Neck Road. After they started construction, they came back and said the trees will act as a sound barrier. When it first started, it worked well. With the increase in traffic and even more industrial work coming in through it, Thank you it's not going to work. Appreciate Thank you. It. Mr. Berdon or Mr. Royal, would you like to rebut? Good 
just just a couple of quick things. Um, we will be meeting our stormwater management policy, as Randy said, um, <clears throat> that is in sync with the resolution that the council adopted. We are we will meet all of those stormwater uh, requirements that are in our current policy and current regs, and that's something I want to make sure everyone completely uh, understands, and I, I know you all do. Um, Mrs. Um, Chapel wanted me to let you all know too that um, because of some of the comments were made at the Planning Commission that her 180-acre um, agricultural and horticultural land on the south side of Damneck Road, just west of and almost bordering on Lake Placid, is under a in perpetuity uh, conservation easement. The state of excuse me, the city of Virginia Beach. That um, all the that agricultural land and treed area. Um, will be maintained in that way in perpetuity. The um, dark skies provision, uh, if you have questions about that, I'm going to let Randy answer those if you have questions about it. Uh, and I will repeat what I said previously that Ms. Mester must not have heard. Uh, the applicant is not requesting and will not request any economic development grants or funds from the city taxpayers. I'd be happy to answer any questions or have Okay, Ms. Henley. Answer. How high are those poles, light poles, going to be? I thought we had a 14-foot limit. Uh, Stanley, I don't think there's a limit. And quite frankly, most of the poles on the site are going to be 25 feet. There are some that are 40. And if we've got to do everything at 25, there's just going to be more light poles on there. But I don't recall the 14. Well, I thought we've got maybe... Well, I thought it was 14 feet. I thought we had changed it. I didn't know. Maybe this is industrial. I'm looking at Mr. Tahan. That's correct. We normally recommend a condition, uh, but this is in an industrial area. Well, in an area identified by the comprehensive plan as industrial. So the limitation. 25 feet. What in the world are you trying to light? Well, it's it's that's your standard street light. But I mean, you're trying to light things up for a, from a safety standpoint, but not not brightly lit. As Mr. Johnston said, I mean, we're certainly going to turn down the lights, not cut them off, but turn them down at night. There's no reason to leave things on bright, but when they are loading and unloading, they want things lit up so people can see what they're doing out there. But everything is directed down. It's not directed up. Are they there's shielded? No Yes, ma'am, and they're not, there's no spillover. There's nominal spillover outside of the site. And the closest neighbors here are about 3,000 feet away. I understand that you can still see a ways, but it's, it's, we're not in anybody's backyard, immediate backyard. Okay. Anyone else? And, and I, one more thing while I'm up here, if I got an opportunity. Trucks. Yes, they come in at, at night, not necessarily in the middle of the night. There's only about 30 trucks per day that come in there. That's not a lot for a facility this large. Okay. Anyone else at this point? Okay, thank you. Mr. Tower. I move the approval of the... Okay, we have a second? Second. All right, vote is open. Give us just a second. It's open now. By a vote of 10 to 0, you approve the application. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, on the next one, uh, the ordinances on the uh, short-term rentals, we are, uh, chair is going to elect that we'll combine all three, okay, for uh, expediency because it uh, looks like we have 19 speakers, you know, signed up. Okay. I don't mind hearing them all, but I would like to separate, when it comes time for a vote, Mr. Mayor, the rules and regulations from the other Okay. Two. But I don't mind holding here okay. one hearing. Okay, that would be, that, that. thank you, Mr. Moss. Okay, uh, for short-term rentals, A, amend section 241.2 of the CZO raise short-term rentals and establish additional state safety requirements. Um, B, uh, okay. Um, and then amend uh, city zone ordinance for CZO section 102, establish short-term rental overlay north end district o uh, oceanfront resort and then also amend official zoning map by designation and corporation of the property into short-term rental overlay districts, North End and Oceanfront Resort District. The, okay. first, the first speaker is Kendall Maynard. 
And after Miss Maynard will be Barbara Messner. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Hey, doing good. Thank you. Okay, I believe I'm representing the Virginia Beach Hi. Short-Term Rental Alliance, so I get the 10 minutes for them tonight. It's great to see you all, uh, Mayor Dyer and the council members. My name is Kendall Maynard from 108 45th Street. You've seen me here before. I am a legal grandfathered short-term rental. Tonight, I told you I'm representing the VBSTRA Alliance with over 400 members. We have researched other cities, proposed other options, requested a task force, reviewed polls by the uh, Hampton Roads Realtors Association, Paige Miares uh, presented that information, and all to no avail. Um, part of this background is for Mr. Holcomb. I hope he returns soon. We are part of the tourism industry and as such have never been recognized or asked to even sit at the table. There has been no inclusivity for vacation rentals. Maybe with some hope, someone will listen to reason and logic tonight. Let's start with page 466 and your bookmarked agenda. Background, what is already required? In an email sent on September 2nd to you all, I included the link for the current application which shows all the requirements already needed. I have had to apply twice this year with the same application then add two more documents. I was told that since it was a new process that everything had to be resubmitted with the second application for the zoning permit, I included 16 pages of documentation to complete the new process list of requirements. I'll go through those real quick. A check for 200, done, completed the second application, pages two and three. The new document, sworn statement, which is actually the same as the bottom of the original application. Survey again, approved parking plan again. The new life safety inspection report is four pages and that is completed, yes. I had to include again the proof of $1 million in insurance. Approval letter dated June 2nd, 2021. The letter for proof of taxes again that I paid before July 1st of 2018 and I included the copy of my current business license for 2021 from the Commissioner of Residue. Yes, we have been told that all of this will be required every year to obtain that zoning permit that we paid $200 for. Did you read the article I sent last night? The Virginia pilot about STR is written by Stacy Parker dated September 6. It was saying Virginia Beach is missing out on short-term rental opportunities and it also quoted Mr. Rouse, Councilman Rouse, and the ODU, ODU economist Agrawal. Uh, Councilman Rouse wasn't keen on the idea when it came up in July 13th meeting. Quote, this overlay district discussion places more opportunity in the oceanfront area of our city, which further exacerbates the perception that preferential treatment is preferred at the oceanfront. The concern is equity throughout the city. The article goes on to state, from The Economist that the rules should be simple, not complicated. This is not even close to simple and extremely complicated and becoming more costly. We contribute, as in the article stated, over $394,000 to the bottom line in July of 2021. That was from the article quoting, quoted by Stacy Parker. Let's look at the 75% rules that were imposed July 13th. It was created to appease the unverified concerns of a few individuals in our community. The implementation and enforcement were never specified, making this regulation a risky decision that could potentially lead to new forms of compliance and enforcement issues. I sent an email requesting more information and have yet to receive any information from either the Zoning and Planning Department nor I asked Mr. Duhaney for information. On behalf of the VBSTRA, I still request that information in order to move forward with what STRs may be able to have in the future. Page 468 of the bookmark agenda, lines 38 through 42. I sent another email asking about signage. This is over-regulation. You already have the information on file. Why or oh why are you even considering this? My neighbors oppose that I have a sign on the front of my house because it will bring criminals to our street just stop, please stop, enough is enough. Would you want your phone number posted on the outside of your house for the whole world to see, for the criminals to come rob you? The application would I, which I have, on, have had to file twice this year with the zoning department already has not only my phone number but an additional emergency contact number. 
Can't you just use that information that is already on file? Again, do you want your number on the, on the front of your house for the criminals to see? Maybe I should just put up a come rob me flashing neon sign. Again, this is not reasonable or logical. Again, how is it displayed on multi-unit buildings, which I think Ms. Wilson asked at the uh, workshop earlier. Please do not vote for signage on my personal house. Thank you. Next, we talked about grandfather status. We agree with lines 74 through 84 to please allow that those that obtain the CUPs to go to grandfather status and that they <coughs> do not expire at five years. This will actually alleviate some burden on your poor city staff. Safety standards and inspections was next for short-term rentals, but these should be held to the same standard as long-term rentals should, not more. <coughs> Lines 88 through 109, if you're following along in your bookmarked agenda. Inspections, these inspections can be done by the property owner. I've already done the life safety inspection and turned it in. As long as property owners are allowed to do their own inspections as I did, we believe this should be sufficient. But the wording in lines 106 and 109, that it be a required inspector, is another overreach of government. This needs to be changed in the ordinance to read property owner. Brandon Beaver sent an email on August 25th asking the city attorney's office to contact him regarding the below in regards to the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution and the legality of your inspectors entering his home. Basically, the simple answer is no, unless there's a valid reason. It goes on to read, the threshold of a person's home may not reasonably be crossed without a warrant. Lines 130 through 136, which I'm sure you've read as well. Structural inspections. While some may need inspections every three years, others do not. Depends on the materials used, how it is attached to the house, if it is an event house or not. Event houses should be rated for 60 pounds instead of 40 pounds per square foot, etc., etc. For example, what if the deck is built with treks instead of wood? I spoke with two engineers and they have very differing opinions. Consider the materials and attachments. Some may not need inspections for five or 10 years or longer. But to make a blanket requirement that will cost homeowners an additional $300 to $500 every three years is not reasonable, not to mention costly. The engineers should be the ones to make the determination if a deck structure and when it should be inspected, not dictated by the city government regulations. Regulations should be reasonable, clear, and logistically enforceable. Lines 138 through 141, ledgers. Again, you get this information. If the expensive taxpayer compliance software is tracking this information, then why would you need an additional written ledger every year from us and creating an additional burden on your city staff? My contract clearly states the maximum occupancy allowed at my house. My monthly reporting to the Commissioner of Revenue gives the number of nights. I know you can't see that information, but they give the, I give the number of nights to pay the tax, the lodging room tax. Therefore, the Virginia Beach Short-Term Rental Alliance finds this a complete waste of time for your city personnel. It is unnecessary and burdensome and does not address unregistered listings, which is what you're really trying to find. Regulations should be clear, reasonable, and enforceable. Overlays. We truly believe are so discriminatory. Oceanfront and North End should both be by right, not overlays that cause some to be more privileged than others. I believe this was stated by Councilman Rouse in July, on July 13th. Virginia Beach Short-Term Rental Alliance completely agrees that lines drawn around certain areas gives more property rights to some owners while taking away property rights from others. The more affluent are able to buy second homes and leave it vacant while others have to rent in order to make it enough to pay the bills. What about the condos that have STR condos allowed already in their condo docks? And have they all been accounted for? especially if they are outside the proposed overlays. For example, the units built specifically for vacation rentals right across from the Wyndham in the North End. The 75% rule is completely wrong and unattainable. Overlays are wrong. The entire oceanfront OR North End should be allowed by right. North End only has, has an estimated 11% in rentals. Again, in comparison, Sandbridge is approximately 50% vacation rentals. The ruling was made to appease the few and not the majority. The evidence from polls presented at a previous meeting proved that the ordinance that was passed was not the majority. Again, council has never asked one member of the vacation rental community to sit at the table, discuss the issues, find viable and logistic logical solutions for inclusivity. 
In summary, we request no signage on our homes, no ledgers, CUPs be grandfathered, property owners be able to fill out these life safety inspection sheets, and reasonable time frames for structural inspections dictated by engineers themselves, <coughs> not a blanket three years. My home was built in the 1930s, and I have eight by eight three posts on Thank each corner. Thank you very corner. much. Appreciate it. Any questions? Any questions at all? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Barbara Messner, and after uh, Ms. Messner is Gil Matola. I've been addressing this along with the Sandbridge people since 2014. Um, instead of just taking care of the problems that they had, you know, the wild parties and, you know, people parking the uh, <clears throat> motor coaches in driveways and in the street, you just went after everybody else that had a short-term rental Airbnb and you wanted a piece of the action. I agree with some of these people. I'm against the amount of short-term rentals. But, um, you know, if they're operating safely, I just, but I do believe, you know, Ms. Henley, you, it used to be several of you. Mr. Jones used to be opposing them. Um, you know, if you don't have enough people, this was an issue in 2014 when Mr. Hansen had meetings at the library. Um, <clears throat> you don't have enough people to inspect these, the health department, public safety, you know, you have to examine these. If they're going to operate like a hotel and it's not going to be a six-month rental, if you're going to operate like a hotel and you're going to have strangers, then you need to have security. And I, I oppose having, having it in residential neighborhoods. At one time, Mr. Tower, who's for everything, um, you know, you said, what about 10% limit? You know, so the neighborhoods weren't, you know, totally destroyed. So people, you know, could find affordable housing. You're allowing businesses in neighborhoods and their trucks. You're allowing people to babysit dogs from the animal shelter. Uh, people can sell guns out of their home. I mean, we don't have normal neighborhoods anymore. And our police are overworked and understaffed. Um, Like I said, um, we need to have a limit. You talked about a moratorium. I think the meeting at last fall at the convention center went to 1.30 in the morning. We've given you our input over and over and over, but all you hear is dollar signs, ching, ching, ching. What won't you sell us out for? Gail Matolo. And after Ms. Matolo is Bob Hughes. Good evening. As far as the actual um, requirements, it is a further suppression of people's rights who are property owners, private property owners especially. Um, I oppose all of the overlays and I definitely do not agree with what you are proposing for those people who want to rent their homes out in whatever decision they decide. I'll, that's all I'll say for now. I'll speak on the other two issues. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, they're all. Ma'am, ma this Mayor. is uh, all, all the, all the uh, issues are lumped into the one. So you know, please say what you have to say oh, and okay. all the short term all right. rental all at once. items. Okay, fine. I noticed the city council of the Clearfield document that states a corporation is not a government. Do you still claim to have authority to create overlays? Two, I provided the city council with the Dun & Brand Street number as evidence that it is a corporation. 
do you still claim to be a governmental body representing the people? We, the people. Three, I noticed the members of the city council that you are not immune under the Tucker Act. I noticed the members of the city council that you are not immune <laughs> under 18 U.S. Code 241 and 242. Do you still believe that you have immunity for the pattern and practice evidences evidenced by your numerous attempt to create overlays without consent or authority granted by we the people? Four, I noticed the city council that it was in violation of the Virginia Constitution. That was Article One. Do you believe that as a corporation and as employees of that corporation, you are not bound by your oaths of office to uphold and honor Article I of the Virginia Constitution? You all work very hard, and I know that, but this is not right for the people of Virginia Beach. Many, many things are going on that should not be happening. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Bob Hughes. And after Mr. Hughes is Donald Cutchin. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council members. My name is Bob Hughes. I'm a 21-year uh, short-term rental owner at 2113 Atlantic Avenue, Camel Condominiums. <clears throat> and I'm here representing myself as an owner and also the other 14 owners at, uh, at Camla, And I want to thank you for reconsidering the decision to only allow uh, grandfathered um, short-term rentals within uh, the Oceanfront Resort District. Uh, short-term rentals have been a way of life at the Oceanfront for uh, as, as long as I can remember. And we've been here in Virginia Beach since 1978, off and on. <clears throat> um, a question was raised earlier about why is the Oceanfront Resort District different from any place else in, in Virginia Beach. I think that was a, a topic brought up in the, in the newspaper article. Um, my answer to that is <coughs> the city recognized the unique features of the oceanfront in 2012 when they passed the resort form-based code, which established uh, you know, five different frontages in the, in the oceanfront, with each frontage having a different set of permitted uses, conditional uses, and um, that's about the other the other word there is uh, and and use standards. <clears throat> so that get, that provides a framework for the city council to apply towards short term rentals because you've you've already recognized um, you know the uh, the the beach <clears throat> uh, frontage the the gateway frontages and the shopping frontages as having specific uses. So why not apply short term rentals to those specific frontages? For example. The shopping frontages on the east side of Atlantic, which would be Camelot condominiums, why shouldn't short-term rentals be allowed there by right or as a permitted use? If you wanted to protect other areas, such as the beach, with a lot of single-family residents in the beach frontage, you could make that a conditional use <coughs> permit requirement. But there's, you know, in the commercial areas, the uh, short-term east side, short or shopping east side and west side, and the gateway, why can't short-term rentals be? A permitted use right now because you know, that's strictly a commercial area and there aren't any residential properties that uh, are, are not many. I, I drove down 19th Avenue and I've counted seven residential properties on that uh, area which is part of the um, uh, the gateway. Anyway, so that's uh, that's all I've got and I'll uh, end it at that. Thank you. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Donald Cutchin. And after Mr. Cutchin is Margie Chapman. Good evening. Good evening. How are you doing? Council members, I'm doing well. My name is Don Cutchin. I reside at 108 45th Street. I am for STRs, but I'm against discrimination. The biggest one has always been overlays in my eye. You own property in Ocean Resort area or the North End, and you can afford to buy those areas and you have a chance for short-term rent. But for the majority of the people in Virginia Beach, 
you have no chance. That's discrimination against the majority rather than a minority. The signage that comes up, a two by two sign with your name and telephone number on it, isn't required by hotels, condos, long-term rentals. Why discriminate against the short-term rentals? The ledger that's listed, a list of every renter of the, for the year, is it required for the condos, the hotels, the long-term rentals? That's discrimination. And as an aside, what is the city going to do with the list of my clients, my renters for a year? Thank you. Thank you. Marty Chapman <clears throat> and Elaine Feckety. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. My name is Marjorie Chapman, and I've been an SDR property manager for 30 years, which brings me here tonight. I believe that the OR district property owners should be able to rent out their properties by right. After all, they are located in a commercial area and in no way can be compared to the North End, which we all know is a residential area. I also understand that there is new language regarding the parking regulations in the oceanfront high-rise high buildings in the OR area, and I want to thank you for reconsidering that. I would also hope that when we register our grandfather properties in other areas of the city that don't meet your parking requirements, that you also realize that parking has not been an issue in the past on those either and let us continue as we always have and not to use it as a reason to not allow us to continue renting them as long as we abide by all the other CUP rules. Okay, signs. Placing a sign in front of our SDR is like putting a target on our back. Not to mention how tacky this will look to our tourists. It seems to me that this information can be is, that is listed on the registration should be significant. After all, if someone has to complain about an STR, they're going to have your new STR number, and that information would be on file to share, being the only time someone would really need, to, uh, need that information if they, is if they had a complaint. After all, you don't require a sign on any <laughs> rental over 30 days. If you're going to require an inspection, it should be held to the same standard as the long-term ones, and a signed affidavit should be enough to verify that it meets the insurance requirements. Why are you trying to play the role of insurance agents? The ledger does not address unregistered listings. It's burdensome on the host and has more of a burden on the city staff. I understand that you have software in place that will give you the same information. I also would love it if you would make see if you would grandfather all the CUPs. Whatever the outcome is, I would like to see that your regulations are clear, but most of all that you have the authority to enforce them. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Whitney Harding. <clears throat> and after Miss Harding is Jerry West. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for allowing everyone to speak again. I'm going to be brief because I've spoken a few times, kind of more of an overview for you since you haven't been here. I'm a resident of 65th Street. I am a mom of three young boys. So my concern with uh, short-term rentals um, as a North End resident is for safety concerns. Um, you know, my kids are young, and if we have parties and things thrown in my yard and trash and you know my toddler picking up things from parties um, my kids being awakened we actually have fireworks um, uh, regularly now um, but I want to you know address the article that was out to you know we um, people should be able to do what they want with their own property but in a, a zoned, you know, commercial 
um, area. So we are a quiet residential community where we know our neighbors, we get together with them often, um, I'm able to leave a key. If I have a short-term rental next to me, who am I leaving a key when I go on vacation? I can't give it to the guy who's there, you know, partying for the weekend. Um, you know, it's time to fix the problem and enforce the CUPs that are already there and hold legal ones accountable. Um, $200 fine isn't enough. 200 a day, that's gonna get people thinking and stop in their tracks. Um, I spoke with Councilwoman Wooten and I emailed everyone about the Flagler County, um, what they're doing in Florida for their short-term rentals. It is in um, commercial. Um, but they have strict rules on applications, they have fines, fees, um, they know each person, your address, your name, um, you even give your children's names, ages, everything. They know everyone in that residence and it's limited to four guests beyond that. And at any point in time, they can kick you out. Um, I would like you to uphold your promise from the July meeting that you will take the North End out of an overlay district. And please listen to the residents. You don't have 75%. You don't even have 60% of the vote. Um, we really want to be taken out. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Jerry West. And after Miss, Miss West is Joan Davis. Welcome. Thank you. Yes, I'm here once again. <laughs> And I want to start out by just thanking every one of you for listening to the residents of our single family neighborhood, the North End, and deciding to reopen the issue of keeping the North End out of a short term overlay. We've made a lot of, I think, very good arguments here over the past few council meetings. We've also enjoyed a lot of community um, uh, getting together um, for, for the issues that are at hand, a lot of participation, civic participation, which I haven't seen in many, many years. And so I'm basically here to reiterate um, that the commercial aspects of short-term rentals in single-family neighborhoods are not compatible. We're not zoned for it. Allowing it would be upzoning without any reason other than um, for financial gain. And I really want to thank each one of you for considering so deeply the way you have and for listening to all of us over the, over the months that this has been going on um, and for reconsidering that we do not um, end up in a short-term rental overlay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Joan Davis is not in attendance. Brandon Beavers, and after Mr. Beavers is Ruth Barnhart. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good to see you again. Brandon Beavers, for the record. Um, so it's interesting. We've been doing this for quite a few years now and months, and I think when we were here at the beginning of the summer, we heard the horror stories about shootings and, and just total mayhem going to take place at all the short-term rentals. We're now at the end of the season. We had a wonderful season. Um, I don't think we had any shootings at short-term rentals. I don't think we had any crazy you know, debauchery. Um, there was even a shooting in Birdneck Point, which was at a long-term rental. So you know, I think what the folks have said earlier, it's a little discriminatory to think that all of this stuff that we're talking about is, is uh, short-term rental related. The, the new article from the ODU research team that came out, um, we spent five years on this most recent water abatement project. Why do we need to change the rules of the game on short-term rentals when we haven't even given it two years? Um, and we spend all the other time on, on things like water. So, you know, just food for thought. Um, you know, the article came up and basically said, you know, less restriction is better for the folks that are actually doing the right thing and registering with the city, letting you know who we are. I don't think it's us that you're after. It's the folks who aren't registered, the folks who aren't playing by the rules. But I submitted my application in June for my grandfather's status. I've been doing this since 2015. I've heard nothing. Did all of the, all of the things that I'm supposed to do for what? Um, 
you know, to impose a $200 fee, frankly, there's over 2,000 short-term rentals in the city of Virginia Beach. I'm no mathematician. That's $400,000. And we did a FOIA request, and we asked, how much is it going to cost for two inspectors? It was less than 180000 So where's that other 100000 bucks going to? That's my question. I mean, just simple math. I mean, it's, it's not chump change. That's six figures. Um, you know, this is a, in my opinion, a, uh, a landowner's rights. I have the right to buy a house, sell a house, and rent a house. Now, the duration of my rental should be no zoning issue here. Uh, there's been city after city across the country, most recently in Tennessee, where a judge <coughs> ruled against the zoning um, that was put forth on short-term rentals. And the, and the city had to pay up. And it wasn't a couple bucks. It was quite significant. I don't want my city taxpayers have to pay for lawsuits that are going to come forth as a result of these unjust zoning regulations on folks who are doing what they legally have the right to do. Thank you. Thank you. Ruth Barnhart. And after Ms. Barnhart is Jeff Stradler. <coughs> Excuse me. Hello. Thank you all. Good evening. Good evening. I have um, spoken before um, on the web, but it's the same uh, situation. My name is Bruce Barnhart, and I have, am a grandfathered short-term rental in Old Beach. I've owned uh, properties in Virginia Beach since 92, and I've been doing the short-term rental for several years. I actually did the long-term rental for a while, and I have two runners that still owe me money that didn't take well and take care of the property. When I am doing a short-term rental, it is being monitored every week. I'm making sure that things are taken care of, <coughs> and it, it's my responsibility, not a uh, long-term renter. Um, our guests are often military families. Uh, they continue to come back, um, visit Virginia Beach again because of the convenience and the comfort they have of staying in a home and also for the safety and security they have of Virginia Beach and just enjoying being able to walk to the beach and uh, have their family all together in one home. I do appreciate the difficulty that you all have in trying to please all your citizens, but it's we who need to be uh, taken care of and listened to, not the hotel owners and not the timeshares or the apartment developers. Um, I do feel that the penalty should go toward the people who are violating the rules and not the people who are paying the taxes and are keeping up with their properties and vetting their guests. Um, we have so many other factors that are causing uh, some of the deterioration as far as see it in the city. And one of it is you know, one of and all these apartments, we're getting people in, we're getting more crowds, more people, more waste management, more police protection needed, more parking needed, but you're not getting the tax income of a property owner. And there are some of these renters that will actually still do a short-term rental, and what can you do to them? Because they're still runners, they're not owners. Um, I not sure about these overlays they are very confusing it seems like they establish more rules but i do think that short-term rentals should be by right uh being grandfathered in i don't think there should be a time limit on grandfathering in i think it should be indefinite and if there is any dormancy it could go to five years but i think there should be all uh if you're grandfathered you're grandfathered and i also feel that to kind of reduce the apartments that are being added to help with the crowds and the security and the things that we need. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. The next speaker is Jeff Stradler. And after Mr. Stradler is John Spicer. Good evening. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Jeff Stradler, and uh, I'm a North End resident. I've lived there since 1999. Um, and I've spoken several times before on this issue, so I promise not to repeat all the remarks I made before. Um, but I am speaking in opposition to including the North End in an STR overlay district. Um, you know, 
I will repeat one thing that I said before, and it goes back to the very first time I spoke. I pulled out the agenda that we had for the meeting, and at the top where it says City of Virginia Beach Community for a Lifetime, I can't think of anything more inconsistent with a community for a lifetime than a short-term rental that is turning over every other night. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out, and I just, to be honest, didn't notice this till the other day, but the primary entrances to the North End on Atlantic Avenue or on Shore Drive, you have these signs up that say, welcome North End, a neighborhood since 1917. The neighborhood is more than a century old. And by turning, by allowing more STRs into the neighborhood, it will dramatically transform the quality and the character of the neighborhood. Um, in possibly you know a very short amount of time um and i heard the speaker the gentleman too before me who said hey that you know there was a shooting at the beginning of the summer and um you know we haven't heard about any more of those and i that that's true i can tell you on our street though we've had parties until 4 a.m in the short-term rental that's on our street um i've so i've witnessed parking disputes over it um and noise late into the evening including just this past sunday night um, so, it, you know, it was represented by Councilman Wood at the last meeting, as well as some others uh, that are here tonight, uh, that the North End would not be included in the o STR overlay district. And I would just respectfully ask you all to keep that promise. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> John Spicer. And then Mike Meg. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for your time. Uh, my name is John Spicer. I have two condos at 22nd and Atlantic in the Camilla building. Uh, we've owned one of them since 1984. I'm no stranger to Virginia Beach. However, I don't live here. Uh, I do understand some of the concerns about STRs, but I'm here to talk about Oceanfront Resort District. Uh, one of our condominiums is CUP. One of them is grandfathered, just because of timing. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> we, we have professional property managers manage every one of the condos in our building. Uh, we have better rules and regulations than you guys have put out. I said better. I didn't say more. But we have better rules because it fits our building. It fits our location, it fits our owners, and it fits our tenants. <clears throat> you heard Mr. Hughes speak earlier. He's in the same building. Margie Chapman is our uh, Berkshire Hathaway property manager. Uh, we have very strict vetting guidelines to people that rent. Uh, if I have a tenant that comes in and destroys property, stays up all night long, that affects the other owners in our building. We have very strict guidelines about what we allow in our building, age-wise, uh, you know, shutdown times at night. Um, the only problem that we have in our location is the continued bongo bob out on the street at 2 a.m. I'm okay with it, but that's, <laughs> that's the negative review that I get on VRBO. That's the only negative that we get is Bongo Bob, guitars and out on the boardwalk, and the constant homeless problem at the beach access of our door. Literally at our door and underneath of our balconies all night long. That's the, that's the four star review that we get. Um, you know, that's, that's pretty much all I can say. Other than the gentleman that talked about the $200 and the $400,000, uh, we spent over $100,000 on each of these condos to bring them up to snuff. And in addition to that $400,000, we're bringing in very good people to the area, and we're bringing in a lot of money to the city. Thank you. Thank you. And, sir, be assured, I am not Bongo Bob. Mike Meg, and if I if I pronounce your name wrong, I'm sorry. It's all right. 
And then Lynn, Lynn Hume is next. Um, council members, thank you very much. Um, I'm Mike Maggie, and I own several short-term rentals. And now that council has effectively stopped all new STRs in the city, you've also affirmed the right of grandfathered um, units and STR short-term rentals to operate. Um, so by doing both of those, I hope you take the time now to come up with a plan that's effective, enforceable, and equitable to everyone involved. There's a lot of things coming on, you know, going back and forth, but I propose that we take it two years or a time period to come up and study it and to see and to really obtain data. You know, if there's troublesome STRs out there, you'll be, they'll be identified. Um, but let's get away from all this he said, she said, there was a party at 2 a.m., there was trash left over. Let's get away from that and let's get some real data. If we take some time, you've stopped all the new ones. We don't have to worry about, you know, all these new conditional use permits. But let's take some time, <coughs> study the data. I hear that all the time. Let's make sure we know what we're talking about before we come up with a plan. We've just passed an ordinance a couple of years ago. Let's see if that's working. Let's see if we really need new ordinances. I mean, I hear all the time about bad tenants and parties, but I see that all the time, whether it's people that live in the neighborhood or if it's short term or regular renters. So let's take the time, assemble some real data and then make a decision. Like they said in the, um, the article in the, in the Virginia pilot, if you make it harder to comply, less people will comply. It's just a fact of nature. And the biggest thing I have is, is if you don't use your STR for two years, that's one of these proposed changes, then you could lose that right. But if it's truly in 241.2 where it says the STRs that are grandfathered, they run with the land. If that's really what it means, then if you don't use it for two years, you shouldn't lose that right. I mean, that right was affirmed that we have that right already. So I hate, that's one of the major ones I wanna do. And I just, let's take some time and really think about things before we enact new ordinances. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Lynn Hume. Lynn Hume and then Andrew Cohen. <clears throat> Good evening. Hello. I'm here again. My name is Lynn Hume, and I've lived in the Bay Area since the 1980s. On January 15, 2019, our property rights to have short-term rentals were affirmed by City Council. Many properties were grandfathered. In Code 241.2, short-term rentals shall be subject to the following conditions unless specifically modified by action of the City Council in one, granting a conditional use permit, or two, creating an overlay district. Again, 241.2 can't be modified unless creating a conditional use permit or overlay district, which means grandfathered property should remain grandfathered under the current code. Grandfathered owners didn't show up to all the other meetings because they had no idea these changes were being made. They don't know it now. Unfortunately, council overruled state code by requiring exempt property owners to register with zoning, not in the original 241.2. Previously, planning and council thought the state code prevailed. It would take a legal challenge now at the state level to address this new rule. STR property owners were not given written notice except a tiny ad in the paper if we had known, we would have voiced our opposition. Instead, it was on council's uh, uh, consent agenda and there were no speakers when that rule was made. Next, you vote, you've moved on to change 241.2 under the guise of safety. Mm, we see how this progresses. I figured out why council proposed the overlays, especially in the Bay Area, where no civic leagues or citizens asked for one. It was a way to change 241.2. That overlay proposal enraged the communities. They never wanted it in the first place. 
I own short-term rentals in the Lynn Haven and Bayside districts. My former councilman, he's resigned now, is not here to support, explain, or address these changes and the concerns we've been presenting to him for five years. Who sits at their desk at the city and plans how to get around all these established codes as we, as we the people sit here and beg not to have this done to us? If we don't use our grandfathered STR property as an STR for two years, you're now proposing to take that right away. Why? It's not a safety issue. It's not, a, it's not an overlay. It's, it's completely, it's harmful, it's controlling, and it's unnecessary. Under safety, only STRs will have a vaguely worded deck engineering inspection, not homeowners, long-term rentals, or apartment buildings. The new rules create a hardship to eliminate STRs and take away grandfathered rights. I'm tired of trying to protect our rights. Council said they're tired of it. Making new arbitrary changes to codes will make only, only allow people who won't comply anymore. Let the current rules roll and let the grandfathered property owners retain their current rights. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, this article was amazing. Andrew Cohen, and then we'll begin. We have two WebEx speakers. Okay. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, Member City Council, we've all been at this for quite a while now. Uh, thank you for taking the time to hear so many voices in seeking to get this right. My name's Andrew Cohen. I'm a full-time resident of the North End, where my family and I have lived for 50 years. The proposed short-term rental overlay in the Oceanfront Resort District is, a reasonable, is, is practical and reasonable in that commercial district. However, both you and the Planning Commission rightly recognize that STRs uh, in residential neighborhoods raise different concerns and require closer scrutiny. You've already agreed to remove the proposed STR overlay for East Shore Drive because a large number of residents there objected. A key decision before you tonight is whether to do the same for the North End as you seem prepared to do at your last meeting. Regardless of any action that you take tonight, Virginia Beach and the North End will continue to have a thriving short-term rental industry. But creating an STR overlay in the North End will have significant, lasting, uh, detrimental impacts on our neighborhood, and those impacts will be difficult, if not impossible, to mitigate or reverse, because as, because as you know, it is very hard to revoke a right after granting it. Excluding the North End STR overlay will not change the number of STRs currently operating in the North End, either with or without required permits. So doing this will not penalize any responsible owners, management companies, or guests of those properties, and it will not reduce tourism to Virginia Beach. But it will allow time for council and citizens to see how the overlay works in the Oceanfront Resort District and to work out practical systems for STR monitoring and code enforcement before determining whether to consider additional overlays in the North End or other residential districts. I urge you to accept the request of the North Virginia Beach Civic League and the vast majority of the residents of the North End. Please exclude any North End overlay from the STR ordinance. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I apologize. I do have one additional speaker in person, Nancy Parker, and then we'll go to the two WebEx oh, speakers. Okay. Welcome, Ms. Parker, back to your council chambers. <laughs> thank you very much. You're very kind, sir. And thank you to all the members of council for showing up again tonight. If I could just real quickly thank Jim Woods for his years of service, who's no longer with us. I might also like to welcome Mr. Holcomb. You are going to fill a lot of potholes here in the city of Virginia Beach, many more than you ever would at the state level, and you're going to find this is way harder than what you thought it was going to be. Thank welcome you. aboard. Thank you. And I'd like to also <laughs> thank Mr. Moss and, and Mrs. Henley for their excellent uh, presentation explanation of that bond referendum I want to sign up I want to help out because I know this is something that's super important to the long-term viability of the city of Virginia Beach excellent job um, so moving on to what we're here I'm here tonight because of the article that was in the paper this morning um, SDRs are not purely an economic issue as suggested by this article in the paper today this is a very narrow lens in which to evaluate this issue how does one put a value on the quality of life in a neighborhood? What is the dollar value on knowing your neighbor, peaceful tranquility, sense of safety, sharing and looking after one another? If everything is to be based on tax income to the city coffers, then we will have a very different city. And our neighbors 
as they are long-term residents, units will be secondary to the commodities of Virginia Beach. Strong, stable neighborhoods are the lifeblood of a great city, as this impacts all aspects of a community. They breathe life into schools, religious centers, volunteer activities, hollowed out neighborhoods, whether there is no sense of connection or community creates a personal vacuum. If no one is there that cares about the tomorrow, but only about the dollars today. In reality, it's a, a handful of investors that are trying to drive the issue, and many live in other in neighborhoods or in other areas outside of the city. Us old timers, and I consider myself an old timer because I've been here for quite a few years and quite a few decades, have spent great year, many years of blood, sweat, tears, and dollars creating the fine city that we all call our home. We've, we have made this a very special place in which to live, work, and raise our families, and finally to be able to retire. Can you put a dollar value on that? I don't think so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And good luck in your deliberations in your um, workshop. Uh, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. So the we'll move to the WebEx speakers now. Brandy Flotten, Ms. Flotten, if you will pause two to three seconds before beginning, you are unmuted. Hi, good evening, Mr. Mayor and ladies and gentlemen of the council. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak this evening and thank you for your time devoted to the subject. I want to offer you a different perspective, if I may. Again, my name is Brandy Flotten and I'm a responsible, compliant, and invested homeowner in the Vibe Creative District. I love this community and I'm proud of my part in it. I'm a military spouse and I purchased my home in the Oceanfront Resort area, specifically the Vibe District. Since purchasing my home, I've registered as an STR annually. I've completed the exhaustive process to obtain a CUP, which was promised would be valid for five years. In the two years I've owned my house, I've paid over $10,000 to the city of Virginia Beach in occupancy taxes and related STR fees. I uphold the agreements to which I'm bound within the CUP, and I do all this to be a good neighbor in the city of Virginia Beach. Imagine my dismay to receive a letter last month indicating my five-year permit is no longer valid and I must submit an STR zoning permit annually with additional requirements and fees. As a compliant CUP holder, I'm asked the city to uphold the agreement of the CUP and treat these properties similar to those that are grandfathered in with administrative review and not to further burden those who are actively in compliance. I want to further express that I'm against the burdensome requirement of providing copies of ledgers and the additional deck safety requirements being considered. I believe this to be excessively burdensome and more importantly, redundant of what is already mandated by the SDR conditional use permit rules. For the CUP, I'm already limited to a certain number of guests in my home, three to a bedroom. Furthermore, the CUP is very specific about not allowing special events and parties. Therefore, why would I have any requirements for the safety of my, of my decks? Lastly, the signage. If, the, if we are required to have a mandated signage, how, why couldn't we just utilize our registered STR number and have the city perhaps employ an automated system for registered STRs so anyone could obtain our contact information should it be needed. Lastly, I want to express support for the ocean front resort overlay. I believe not all requirements are, are all neighborhoods are equal. As I've shared, my home is located within the five district, which is a mixed zone and originally dedicated by the city to enhance small businesses, tourism, and to enhance the quality of life for to visitors and residents. I've shared this before, but I have a brewery up against my driveway and I face a funeral home, despite the inconvenience this occasionally. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Uh, we appreciate it. The next speaker is Dana Cullen. Ms. Cullen, if you'll pause two to three seconds for, before beginning. Thank you. You're unmuted. 
Good evening, um, Council, um, Mayor Dyer, Manager Dehaney, um, Amanda Barnes, Jennifer, who helped me with the web connection. Thank you for your time tonight and your dedicated service to our city. My name is Dana Cullen. I'm a North End resident, author of the book Vintage North End Virginia Beach and Illustrated History Archive, which focused on preserving images from my quickly disappearing landscape of my childhood here in the North End, where I'm speaking to you from tonight. Our family has been here for over half a century, occupying an older vintage cottage surrounded by a well-established garden. I'm in a short-term rent rental, an STR permit holder, for a vintage North Edge cottage that was purchased mainly for a family summer overflow cottage, but we used this STR option to create a business plan to help offset the expenses for saving the cottage. And it was in terrible shape when we started. It was marketed as a, a teardown, and it's been much more complicated than if we just knocked her down and built her up high and wide and sold her for profit. But my heart is in saving the vintage what I can in the North End, however I can. And this has been quite the project. I do approve of the city's overlay um, for the resort areas, including the North End where I live, because I do think that a permit process is a good way to sort of um, vet the owner to make sure that they're not um, just building up high and large and making these mini hotels. Um, with the overdevelopment contributing to flooding, we should be watching that and there should be a process. However, um, you know, and, well, I'll get to that. Our, our vintage cottage that we live in is located next to a very well-run short-term rental that we don't own. And this was the first summer it was in full swing. It was packed full of people every single week. And I can tell you the guests that stayed there were the absolute best. We have no issue with short-term rentals personally, even if we didn't own one. The, the new short-term rental paperwork requirement that you have, have um, asked um, the short-term rental permit owners, the legal ones, it's it feels like so much overreach. We just went through the whole process this past year to get our permit, and it now feels like we're just being asked to redo it every year like Groundhog Day. And, um, you know, Virginia Beach is a resort city. We should be embracing the short-term industry as a whole and not setting roadblocks like overly burdensome inspections and stacks of extra paperwork that um, you know, seem like they were spontaneously added to add extra work and burden the, to the short-term rental owners. Um, you know, and future investors may think this is too much red tape and, and, and pull the plug and take their... That's all the speakers, sir. Okay, thank <laughs> you. Okay, at this point, do we have a motion? Yeah. You know, Mr. Tower. Um, I move the approval of the um, of the ordinances as they were presented with two amendments, both of which are amendments to the first section uh, dealing with city zoning ordinance section 241.2. I believe these have been distributed to every member of council, although I'm not sure they are marked to show the changes. Mine are, Bobby, but I'm not sure others are. Let, so let me draw your attention to them. Um, first of all, to make sure you're in the right one, it's the one that says section amended city zoning ordinance 241.2 near the top. Everybody with me? Yep, would you just please reference the line items? Yes, I will. Thank you so much. Now. Now, if you would look at the bottom of that first page, uh, uh, beginning on lines, uh, item number four, or paragraph number four that begins on line 38, uh, the amendment, and I'm going to read it out loud so anyone that has this in front of them can see what the amendment is. The amended language would read of section four, no signage shall be on site except that each short-term rental shall have one four, foot, four square foot sign posted on the building or other permanent structure or location approved by the zoning administrator. 
that identifies the property as a short-term rental and provides the telephone number for the short-term rental hotline in text large enough to be read from the public street. Uh, architectural signs naming the structure are excluded. Uh, the change is, uh, is to provide, and I know several people have referenced having their own phone numbers on that sign. The change uh, makes the telephone number for the short-term rental hotline uh, the number that's placed on the sign. It also gives some, I think, uh, a red in as a whole, it gives some uh, authority to the zoning administrator to uh, locate, uh, to agree with the homeowner or the apartment owner or the apartment building, whatever the is, to locate the, locate the sign in a way that may not be literally compliant with the uh, if it causes a difficulty uh, of some sort to do that. There are many different kinds of buildings that contain short-term short rentals and they don't all accommodate signage in the same way. Uh, the second amendment I would suggest is on page 2, <coughs> lines 76 through 79, uh, which is a l latter portion of paragraph 12. Um, and I believe that we're dealing only with the last sentence that begins on line uh, right up, actually begins on line 75 at the end of 75. Grandfathered status shall run with the land. However, any grandfathered short-term rental that is continuously remains vacant or not used as a short-term rental for a period of two years or more starting from the date of adoption of this ordinance shall lose its grandfather designation. This is not a change uh, of, in the theory, it's just a change to make it clear when the two-year period uh, commences on the date of the adoption of this ordinance. So I move the adoption, Mr. Mayor, of uh, all of these ordinances with those two amendments. Okay. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion, Mr. Moss? Are we just for the adoption of A, or are we doing the adoption for all three? I think I heard you say all three. Is that I, I, correct? Yeah, I thought we were going to consider them as one. Well, well let's do this, uh, this one. I would like to do the regulations separate from the other two. I, I think I had requested that. Okay. And I, and I just have a few things that come to mind I'd like to share, and, and I'm not saying that that's where I'm going to rest, but I have... A couple things. One, I'm concerned that we're distinguishing the requirements for people who have a property manager from people who don't. And that's number one. I have a concern with that. I think why why are we giving a privileged consideration to a property manager over a property owner? I think they should be treated the same, number one. Uh, I'm, I am happy with people, myself, and I've said this before, about the certification because people have the liability if they don't stay it the lawsuits will take care of it the people that had that deck collapse at sandbridge no longer own that beach house and there's probably a reason because they had a strict liability and they had a problem probably in civil litigation i suspect but so i think that the, that risk factor and the liability and, and losing their property i don't think they they i don't know why they can't certify that they got fire extinguishers and that stuff and why we have to inspect someone's house. I mean, I'm just, I'm just sharing with you my thoughts. I would, I'd like to know if we're trying to get to risk, <coughs> what we want is accountability and who the liability rests with, right? I think that's our goal. Who's, who's got the financial liability? We're making them show proof of insurance, which I like. Uh, those are the things they have to comply with. And believe me, their insurance company is probably more concerned about that than probably we are, I suspect. I see some nods in the audience on that. And, and who knows, they might even inspect them themselves. But if they sign an, an, an affidavit that tells us that that's been done, I don't care if it's the property manager or if it's the property owner, that would be, for me, would be sufficient because now that's in the record. They've certified that. Believe me, some lawyer will be digging that up on a FOIA request that we get and 
they'll be happy to use that in court. So I think that will motivate people. And if not, they get to own a short-term rental. Um, and the other thing I was concerned about is this, and I've mentioned this before, and I know this ledger. <laughs> and I know Mr. Wood was thought that this was important, but I'm interested for someone to tell me, you know, what the added value and what is that giving us? I mean, I'd like to have that. My last thing of interest, and I do support this, but certainly someone questioned it, and I know this has been reviewed for legal sufficiency. So I understand where the two-year period starts from the date of this for starting, but when someone stops in the future, is the definition meaning whenever their last rental that they did, is it 24 continuous months? I, that's not operationally explicit here, and maybe, maybe that's obvious, but it, well, I just want, just for ambiguity's sake, it says two points from this date, but it really says is that's when the, if you didn't rent between now and then, but if you rented something in December and didn't rent from 24 continuous months after that, this provision would still apply. Is that correct, Mr. And that's the that correct is, yes. interpretation of this? Yes, sir. <coughs> okay. I, for people reading, I'm just trying to make sure. But, and Mr. Tower, I know you've done a lot of hard work on this, and there's been lots of stuff. But I, I, I do, well, I don't buy into the economist of views, and everything comes down to money. And I think people tend to think that under our current zoning ordinances, people have a right to short-term rentals, but they really don't. It's not, and they might say that the, our zoning ordinances are unlawful. Well, I guess that's for courts to decide later. But as it stands under zoning or that there isn't any existing property right to a short-term term rental. But I'm, I'm not having any problem with the grandfathering. But the ledger and the inspections, and I'm not in the property business like my good colleague Mrs. Wilson is out there with the operators, but I don't think we should make a distinction between short-term rental management companies and just a single owner of their property. Um, I, I think an affidavit is an affidavit, and if they, something goes wrong, a lawyer is going to grab it, and they'll be in court, and they'll enforce it, and someone will end up paying. So those are just my thoughts. Hey, Mr. Rouse. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Unless, Mr. Tower, did you want a rebuttal um, against Mr. Well, Wilson? Well, um, uh, go ahead. I, right. I'll do that when you're done. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilman Tower. I think I've, I've made clear uh, my position on, on the short-term rentals throughout our city. Um, I'd just like to reiterate that and, and explain uh, my reasons for not supporting this ordinance. Um, it, it goes back towards creating overlay districts and um, undoing the process that took uh, a fair amount of time and dedication and commitment from not only this, this body but from stakeholders, also from community as well, to come up with a short-term rental ordinance um, about three years ago that was designed the last five years, um, CUP that is, and now we just getting rid of that in two years. Um, so I, I don't agree with that, that, that approach to solving this issue of short-term rentals and what this new industry does to our city. I think we all agree that we want to protect our communities. We want to protect the, the culture and integrity of our, our, of our communities. Um, as well, and I think that's something that we can achieve. But I think we achieve that, especially when it comes to short-term rentals, by enforcement. What we found out a lot, and just to share here in the, from the communities, what a lot of the issues associated with short-term rentals came from illegal short-term rentals, came from people who are not unwilling to comply. And those members who went out, um, who went out and went through the process of complying of paying their fees, paying their dues, doing everything right, and to receive a letter in the mail that said, well, your, your CUP is no longer applicable, um, no longer worthy after two years when it's designed to last five years, I think that's, I think that's a shortcoming on our part to, to kind of reinvent the wheel in the middle of a process. Um, with that being <laughs> said, um, and, and again, I, I don't agree with overlay districts because I think that places an unfair um, advantage for certain parts of segments within our community. And if you're a community such as the North End community, you, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't, it should not, uh, a short-term rental overlay should not be imposed on you without you guarding the, the, the amount of support needed to make your, 
your neighborhood or your community and overlay district. Um, but I understand the, of making the overlay district the, the short-term rental by right in the OR district because essentially you can create, you can build a hotel anywhere in the OR district. So with that being said, if Councilman Tower, if you wanted to amend our zoning within the OR district to include short-term rentals by right, I'm more than happy to um, support that. Uh, but just creating the overlay districts and, and getting rid of a process that took a fair amount of time and a lot of hard work um, through everybody involved to create a whole new ordinance for short-term rentals, um, I just don't think it's, it's a fair and equitable way to go forward. So, okay. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rouse. Mr. Tower. Well, let me respond to Mr. Rouse first, make sure I understood him. You, uh, the having, I propose when we are done here that this, the, that what we're doing here is, is imposing an overlay, if you will, on the OR district, which I believe to be con consistent with a hotel district. I agree, yes. And, and therefore, while there are single family homes in there, um, it's difficult to reject. That's number one. Number two, doing it by right, after much consideration, and I've tried to accommodate a number of differing views, uh, and I have never had a problem personally with doing it by right, but there were people who wanted to have the, con the CUP process mm -hmm applied so i agreed somewhat reluctantly but i agreed in order to tr move the thing along uh, that we would i would support having a cup process for the even in the or district uh, at this point the way i understand where this matter is procedurally in order to have it by right we would have to go back to planning commission We'd have to re-advertise it. We'd have to redo it. I think so many of the people in this room have been here all the time ever that we've been here. I just cannot, in good conscience, inflict that on anybody. I don't see the harm in, uh, in the CUP process. I think most of council would find that most applications by far for our CUP within the OR district, given the history, given the location, are not going to be pro troublesome or problematic mm -hmm. for them. It's possible one could be, but I think most of them will not be. So I have no problem personally with uh, by right, but the way we're postured, it's going to be C with CUP. CUP. And, I, and I definitely support, support that as well. I, I guess what I'm trying to understand and differentiate is between creating an overlay district and just having a CUP process for the OR. Well, the, 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 the over the, the OR would be in, in effect an overlay district. It'd be the, the it and Sandbridge would be, uh, the only overlay districts in, uh, in the city, I believe. Ms. Hanley, uh, no, looks like she wants to add. But I'm confused because you're saying you would still be requiring the CUP. Yes. N no, that's not. It's an overlay district. It gives it by right, isn't? I don't. I don't believe that's the way it's postured now. All right. In Sandbridge, it is. Yes. yes. It's by right. Yes. But you may recall, and I do, that night when we made the corrections, and it was a correction that you proposed. When you looked at that chart where we put the X's, and I know Mr. Tahan knows of what I speak, you made the notion about, oh, this ought to be conditional use. That chart matrix, and I don't have it in front of me, but I see Mr. Tahan nodding his head, that was changed to conditional use and was adopted as the rules for overlay districts as a whole. Getting to the other point, I'm not mean to take Mr. Stiles' jobs over. He might prefer I talk versus him in this particular case. But if we move to the point that you were referring to and said just conditional use permit, that creates the very exposure we are trying to preclude by going to overlay districts to have a defensible and demonstrative and standard and systematic way for deciding where future short-term rentals would be. Because where we were before is, 
anywhere in the city you could apply for a conditional use permit. I don't think any of us really want to go back to the past on that. This says that we, since hotels are a matter of right in the OR district, a hotel, in fact, is a short-term rental. It's a daily, weekly, any frequency you want. And so therefore, if it's a hotel is by a right, by right use, getting back, to, then I don't know how we would ever be able to legally not approve a conditional use permit that was requested. And I think that's pretty true. Mm -hmm. But what Mr. Uh, Powers is saying is that to, to go this other route, because we can say yes, but to go this other route further d impedes the property owners in there who really should have a buy right use, but we're not there. Now we go back, it's another six, three months, we chew this sandwich about three or four times, it doesn't taste so good. And so the, the, the best technical fix that gets the people the result that we want to give them in a timely fashion is to approve the ordinance that are in front of us and that gets us there, it gets the result, but in the end, when you get these conditional use permits, they're just going to be matter of fact. And I've had that conversation with many people who live in the OR district, and I've told them that, that there'd be no basis in my judgment by which you could not approve one. But how we got there was that technical correction we made to the matrix when we adopted that regulation for the overlay districts. That, we don't uh, have that matrix here. So. But Mr. Tahina, if did I represent that correctly? That is correct. That's adopted in the zoning ordinance. So that is part of the zoning ordinance where any uh, short-term rental overlay district is required by conditional use permit to obtain a short-term rental. Mr. Mayor, if I could. Yes, Mr. Tower. It's different I, from Sandbridge. It, it is. is. It is. Correct, Ex excluding Sandbridge. Uh, <coughs> I want to respond to Mr. Moss's uh, other comments. First, I will say with regard to the, the, um, the ledger, uh, I would refer that to Mr. Tahan for comment. I, as far as I'm not involved in the enforcement issue and what is necessary and of that, and I think he could speak better than I could to that. As Mr. Moss had noted, the ledger request was of uh, the former council member of Wood, uh, the vice mayor. Um, speaking on what I heard from that discussion, it was that we would use it to check against our of uh, information that we have to assure that there was the rentals match up with uh, the software system that we have. I, I don't know if I, again, my opinion is not of consequence, but that was of the, that was the discussion that the vice mayor had. Well, Mike, if I could, Jay, yes. that, Mr. well, my thought, and I'm just you know one person among many. If I'm filing something to the commissioner of revenue that's tax, tax fraud is much more serious than incorrect <laughs> ledgers. So knowing how uh, probably uh, paying attention that the commissioner of the revenue is, I, I'm, I'm willing, we rely upon him to check on businesses and lots of other stuff that don't share with us the ledgers of their sales or anything else. So I'm looking and just sharing with my colleagues here is I'm more than willing to rely on the confidence <laughs> of the commissioner of revenue that we're getting the right amount of money and that's gonna be the bed tax and all those things. And in the event that they're not doing that, and he thinks there's an issue, he's in a great position to demand all sorts of justification and audits, and tax fraud's a very serious offense, which we don't have to, which someone else down the street prosecutes. So I think we need to take that into consideration, I believe, in what we are trying to achieve, which is what compliance that we're getting the right revenue. Well, I think Commissioner Revenue is better able to do that than a ledger would achieve. That's just my own personal belief. I, uh, I I can't say that I disagree with that. I, 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 as I said, I, it was not my idea. It was Mr. Woods, uh, and he's not here to defend himself. But I'm I'm certainly willing to make accommodation for that so, point of view. So could we? Rem are you open to removing that? Or yeah, I'm just looking for what line uh, line item that there is. Line? If you could help me I just, somewhere. I see it on the uh, agenda. I, I don't yeah. see it in the line. Yeah, we're gonna. I think we're picking it apart again, and we're not going to know what we're adopting. What? We're I frankly, I frankly thought it was from uh, from your office, Bob. No, sir. That's, no, sir. Okay. It's line 139 through 142. It's section 18 of that. The last, the last. The last. Okay. 139. 
Well, for the, for the sake of getting this done this evening without making a lot more changes, uh, I will support my good colleague there, Mr. Tower, but I may be bringing, now that we don't have, if we make changes to this, do we have to go back to the Planning Commission? Yes, sir. No, you can, you can make changes to this document. The, the problem with the issue that you just discussed is you already adopted the matrix, and so you would be changing the law that you had previously adopted. Right. You have the ability to make changes within the scope of this document. I, I know we don't like to make law at the dais, but I would like to en engage my colleague. I think there's some other things here, but we could make those changes and come back without going to the Planning Commission, that's correct? Like we didn't want to have the in visual actual inspection? That doesn't require us to go to the Planning Commission. Correct, if you wanted to change that now, you did not. You do not have to go back to the Planning Commission. I don't Commission. actually speak to that one now. Yeah, I just, I, I, I'm just telling you know that I'll, I'm gonna support yeah. the motion with that one taken out, but I, I do reserve in my own right to come back and engage my peers on other things here, I think, but I realize I don't want to make these at the dais tonight, but I will support uh, my colleague. Okay. Well, uh, um, may, um, excuse me, I'm sorry. I, I, I misunderstood your question, perhaps, Mr. Moss. If you adopt this tonight, just as you adopted the matrix before, if you want to come back and change what you adopted tonight, then yes, I think that would have to go back to the oh, planet. Well, that's what I was... I, 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 I'm sorry, I, I misunderstood your question. I, because... Oh, but anyway, I'll now listen now to my <laughs> colleague's response. Well, I do think we need to clean it up, but tonight, if we possibly yeah, can. I'm game. Um, and I'm, I'm amenable, uh, if I understand the planning commissioner not uh, interposing any objection to, to the elimination of item 18, is that, is that, is that uh, lines 139 through 142? Yeah, that's 18. If I could just walk through it, maybe better tell you what causes me a concern that might help you. I don't okay, have any well, I was just I was just trying to get to take okay. what I have no objection to as the mover, but I, other people may have objections. I'm not sure what the best way to do it is. Mr. Moss, I'm, I'm open to anything you see. Well, suggest for uh, I don't have any issues method. with 38 through 39 the sign because they can put it wherever they want and I think that makes sense and it's the number of the hotline not the number of the people so we're not saying you know come come rob me or something and here's my phone number uh, I don't have anything <coughs> issues with the grandfather and I understand that legally we have the authority to do that is that correct mr. Stiles I believe so yes sir all right, all right. Uh, we're doing the grandfathering thing which people asked us to do and administratively approve it I think that makes sense. That's the lines that are 81 through 85. When we come down to the 90 range, this talks about uh, zoning inspectors. And my only thought is, and this is just me, one of 11 of us <coughs> here, that I think either the property owner or the rental company should be able to sign an affidavit certifying that these conditions have been met. And when things go ugly, that's when the courts will financially punish the people who, whose affidavit proves to be inaccurate. Uh, that's just Can I comment view. on that? So, so, Mr. Mayor, as, as a point of order, yes. I don't find that the, the way this discussion is being constructed to allow for others to have any input. It seems like a conversation between one or two people at the dais. And I apologize. And I, I would prefer that we open it up so maybe we could recognize one person at a time if it would be agreeable to you. Yeah, that would be fine, and um, yeah, I'm having some heartburn uh, along the same Can line. Can I finish my comments then? Yeah. I'm, I'm not chairing the meeting, but my, I'm just simply suggesting that the nature of this discussion is one that's rather exclusionary of some other members of this of the body. I'll just finish my comments and turn to everybody else. But that is my concern there. On 101 through 105, and this is 107 through 110, gives a property short-term rental management companies, I just say it should be the property owner or a short-term man management. They ought to both have the same privileges to certify their properties. That's all. I don't have any issues with what they're doing. Uh, I don't have any problem with the decking because we've had experience with that. And uh, 
And that's it. That was all my comments. Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> uh, Mr. Bellucci, uh, you know, what's your thoughts? Uh, once again, here we are, you know, we are making some changes at the dais that are uh, thing, but once again, a complicated issue all along. Okay. Um, are, are those uh, are you open to making those uh, I, I am open to making mr. Moss's suggested a, a change with regard to um, the lines 139 through 142 I am not open to making his changes in in the other I, I would make the motion that we be approved with the now three changes we've made now, if I could I'd just like to state the reason I'm not open to him is that I think it's more, it's not, not simply a matter of post-trauma assigning of liability. This is an attempt to prevent trauma to begin with. This is, yes, it's, it's, more, it's more expensive, it's more awkward, but these are people's lives we're talking about. These are safety <coughs> precautions that people are coming to our resort area and renting property that is the for in terms of their attitude and in terms of the mor morality of it, it is a short-term rental. It's like a hotel stay. And the hotels are inspected up the wazoo. They are fully inspected on all of these. This is a mere shadow of the types of inspections that are conducted regularly in buildings where, uh, and, and even in apartment buildings, there are more in, inspections if you're going to be in the short-term rental business you're in the business and you have need, need to take be responsible for those I'm not just worried about the legal responsibility I'm trying to prevent these uh, uh, traumas from happening in the first place and I believe this does a better job of it than eliminating these requirements so that's my motion Okay, uh, Mr. Holcomb. Mr. Mayor, before before we go eyes and nays here, I would like to hear uh, Mr. City Attorney say what's exactly before us right now because I've heard a whole bunch of things come before us and, and I'd like to have some clarity to be in the proper posture to... Uh, I concur with that. Okay. Well, I can't tell you what's before you. I can tell you what I believe is before you and the maker of the motion can clarify if I've got it wrong. There is a document that was passed out to you uh, uh, before you came out for the formal session. It is that document as presented to you with the deletion of lines 139 through 142. I, I believe I have that correct. Yes. Now what I'm not clear on, and this is outside the scope of Mr. Holcomb's question, and I apologize for going beyond the scope of that question, but are we? was the motion only as to ordinance 7a or was it also to the two reconsidered items and if it was to the two reconsidered items was it for the alternative version or the original version as to those two items I just want to be clear I, quite, I think we should vote uh, separately myself on uh, short-term rentals on a uh, the amend section 242 and then maybe do the reconsideration separate yeah. okay I just was clarifying what the motion was so that okay. you could address okay. it. Yes, I would just to clarify, okay, so we are only doing this one that was handed to us when we came in, which is the amended zoning ordinance pertaining to short-term rentals and establishing additional safety requirements. Is that the motion, only this one? The motion is that one with the change that Mr. Okay, Stiles right. noted in the and elimination I may just of clarify 139. You, the, the change that you made in this from what we had considered before uh, would um, uh, have the sign, have the telephone number for the short-term rental hotline rather than the individual homeowner's phone Correct. number. And that the time for the um, grandfathering for the period of two years would start from the date of adoption of the <coughs> ordinance. Correct. Those are the two changes you made. Correct. And I And have, now we would eliminate those I've last. I've acceded to Mr. Moss's suggestion that we delete lines 139 through 142. Okay. Just so I'm clear on what we've changed. Thank right. you very much. That's and, mine. And, and, and Mr. Ralph, I don't want to further confuse you. Just keep on track 
where we are. Lines 101, Mr. Moss, and did you, did, was you not open to that? That was your, okay. No, it's not I, I, that's why I got, I got lost there. Okay. okay. Got it. Thank and, you. And, and, and just for the record, I, I assume the second acceded to those, that, the deletion as well. Yeah. Who was the second? Okay. <laughs> Has there been a, was there a yes. second? Yeah, who yes. was it? Yes. Well, thank Wilson. you. Yes. Sorry. Okay. I, okay. I got lost. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. I think uh, we're going to proceed toward a vote. I guess, you know, one of my concerns has been long standing and, you know, difficult to address is, you know, sometimes by putting a lot of regulations on legal entities, it, you know, it's going to compel you know, uh, illegal entities that really don't want to comply with a lot of regulations. So, but once again, especially with this thing, if, you know, if somebody owns a short-term rental and let's just say they bring in an elderly uh, parent for a couple of years and then they lose their right and everything. So, you know, I'm, I, I, you know, I, you know, I'm still having some heartburn, but once again, I appreciate the efforts of uh, council. Are we ready for a vote on Okay, and that, it, it, it is for this amendment as stated. Has the motion been made and seconded? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. By a vote of seven to three, this ordinance has passed. Okay. Okay, now we are going sorry, to. Can we, can, we, can we review that again? I, 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 must, I got confused. This is for, we, we're doing this, correct? Yeah, just for that. And that would be on, um, you know, item number 7A under the short-term rentals. And then on the next page, uh, the items to reconsider are separate items. Can, miss, can you check my, I want to change my vote. Okay, so you'll, I will need you to state in the, for the record verbally. Yeah, that so I'd like to change my vote to a nay on that. So then it would be six to four. Okay. With Mr. Rouse's nay verbal vote. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, uh, moving forward, items for reconsideration, uh, you know, uh, you know that we uh, recommended coming back and addressing. Do we have a motion on the, you know, we'll consider both of these? Look, I, I'm open to suggestions. Uh, whatever moves moves the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> well, that could be dangerous. <laughs> yes, I'm getting reckless. <laughs> well, I, I, well, I, I would defer to the city attorney to try to give us some advice, but I think what you're wanting to adopt is the, the alternate version, I believe, which is the one that adopts overlay district for OR only. I'm I very that, interested in that. I think yeah. that is the correct one, if I and read And so that. that is the, yes, sir, and that it's is the alternative next. version of both A and B. They are paired, and that's what he really wants to adopt. Okay, and this is paired. I would second that motion. Okay, are there any other discussions at this point? Do I have that? Well, <laughs> yes, Ms. So Hanley. move, second it. Right. Yes. I'm just going to continue to not Senator. vote to include the Oceanfront Resort in the overlay district because even though hotels are allowed in the oceanfront area, hotels are built to a much higher standard code-wise than what will become the short-term rentals, which only have to meet the standards of residences. And what we see happening is then people um, even build uh, a, a facility only to do short-term rental, never intending to live in it themselves or anyone else on a permanent basis, but just build it for short-term rentals. But if you're building it for short-term rentals, you only have to meet a residential standard. You don't have to meet the same kind of standards that a hotel would. So it is different, <coughs> even if it's in the oceanfront. So I, I still think that if it were going to be um, um, allowed that it's it isn't the same thing as allowing hotels and so that's why i um i don't agree with it okay miss wilson and i just want to make sure and also for the public to know we are not voting on the north end as an overlay only the oceanfront resort as an overlay correct is that correct 
Mr. Bellucci, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Stiles, if you could respond then, Mr. Bellucci. I, I, I understand that Mr. Tower's motion, as seconded by Mr. Moss, was to approve the alter alternate version in the agenda, and the alternate version creates an overlay, an STR overlay, only for the ORD and not for the North End. That was my intention. Mr. Bellucci. And also, Mr. Siles, for further clarification, that conditional use permit would be required within the OR district. Yes, sir, because the ordinance that you previously adopted and did not consider included a matrix, and in that matrix you'll see in overlays it says C, which is conditional use permit, rather than P, which is permitted. So, yes, sir, it would be a conditional use in the OR. Thank you. Okay, any other discussion? The vote is open. One second. It's open now. Mr. Rouse? I need a point of clarification. <laughs> I just need a point of clarification. The fact that we, the last ordinance we, we took, it said we, we, we um, outlawed short term rentals throughout the city unless in the overlay district, correct? Correct. And this ordinance, all it does is permits short-term rentals in the OR district with CUPs. Correct. Yes, sir. Okay. By a vote of eight to two, you have adopted those ordinances. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We made it through there. Uh, there are no appointments. Okay. The next item of business under um, unfinished business is no. uh, that, uh, in courtesy to Mr. Rouse and uh, you know, I do agree with the uh, point that, you know, with discussion is warranted. Um, you know, just for the general public to know that we are in the process with Mr. Wood um, resigning, you know, the necessity to uh, appoint. Okay, uh, folks. Okay, let's just, oh, let's just hold on a few minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay, if it's uh, okay. got a few more folks leaving. <laughs> Okay, uh, once again, you know, one of our major responsibilities we have uh, upcoming is the appointment of a uh, vice mayor. And uh, once again, with Mr. Uh, Wood leaving suddenly, uh, we are compelled to make that replacement in somewhat short order, as well as a replacement for the Lynn Haven seat. And, uh, but once again, you know, this was a little not typical because the mayor is elected by the public, but the vice mayor is selected by the body. And under normal circumstances, under a normal election process in November, uh, we have until January when we have to seat a new vice mayor, you know, with the swearing in of the mayor or every two years. And what uh, I did receive some feedback from a couple of council members indicating that, you know, we just needed perhaps a little bit more time uh, to deliberate. And in fairness to, uh, there are three people that have, there are three esteemed council members that have expressed an interest. And, you know, Ms. Wooten was out for a couple weeks and, uh, but, but once again, we want to be able to show that we're being fair and judicious. And we do have a um, retreat coming up next week, which would afford us some opportunity you know, to discuss the nature of this, you know, what is involved with the, uh, the vice mayorship, 
and allow the you know the people that you know are seeking the position you know to stay the case and i think this is you know just waiting shortly uh you know may be in our you know best interest going forward spoke to the uh city um, uh, manager and yes we do have an ambitious an agenda coming up at the retreat but uh, we're going to be starting at 8:30, and one of the things we, we put this, uh, we can put this first on the docket, you know, for discussion and going forward. But um, in consideration to our esteemed colleague, Mr. Rouse, uh, we would have a discussion, and he asked for a poll of the council. So, you know, Mr. Rouse, I yield Thank to you right now. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my point in, in having a discussion with this, I thought it would be prudent, and, and as a recommendation for. For council to consider um, in light of just what that one day retreat all entails and so if I was think it would be important if we could scratch one thing off our off our workflow off our list we can get to doing the, the, the business of the city um, and so the things that we, we have to discuss and, and I mentioned this earlier in our informal session on our council retreat are all things um, that deserve their, their rightful attention and it's gonna require an exhaustive uh, type of discussion and conversation um, back and forth. It may even some even some debate, as my colleagues uh, stated earlier, but those things include stormwater, um, American Rescue Plan, and what to do with those funds and how to, to, to find that balance in making sure our community um, have the resource, resources they need, um, the vacancies throughout our workforce, um, the, the alternate method of of the ocean front where we're talking about um, the uh, rebuilding the initiative by Councilman Tower and Moss um, the CRP um, that we just got uh, a really great report back from a very very, very thorough and uh, report back from from that task force a co cooperative agreement with the school board the Lynn Haven seat um, a budget guide and CIP projects and a legislative packet I don't know how we're going to do all that in one day um, but I thought it would be great if, if we could scratch one thing off that list because um, I know it's very important, Mr. Mayor, as well, to have a vice mayor um, to help you um, really uh, support council um, as well. And, and I thought, I'm not sure, uh, what time are we starting on? 8.30. 8.30? I mentioned 8 o'clock before, and boy, did I get some dirty looks. <laughs> 8.30, and potentially if I, I would... You know, venture to say if we had a vice member within that seat, we probably could start earlier. Um, if I'm not sure of the schedule of council, but I, I know this is something where I just wanted to have a discussion with council, see where everybody was. Okay, but once again, I think it would be prudent. Uh, you know, at the retreat, it is coming up next week, and uh, you know, this is going to be an important decision. And I think it, you know, it's a fairness uh, thing for all the people concerned, not only the council members, but, you know, those who are, you know, seeking the position where we could just have a back and forth. You know, usually if, you know, under, you know, what are normal circumstances these days for us, you know, given the last couple of years. But, you know, over, uh, over a period of the time between the first Tuesday in November and, you know, the seating of, uh, a, a new mayor or a new council, uh, you know, takes a couple months. But I think this is an opportunity for us to have a public discussion. Uh, there was even a recommendation that we talk about this in closed, but, you know, this is the type of thing that I really think the pu public, you know, has to hear. So, you know, with due respect, you know, if we can just go ahead and maybe if we have a uh, recommendation uh, that we uh, just defer this until the um, retreat, which is coming up next week. And at that time, we can work out some of the mechanics among ourselves. And you know, hopefully it won't be, you know, all that town, town con, uh, time consuming. But once again, as we stated before, uh, Mr. Rouse and members of council, you know, we have been uh, uh, using our workshops judiciously. So a number of the items that you mentioned that were under considerations, you know, if necessary, you know, we have at times, uh, even in our informal meetings during workshops and things, if certain things became a priority, we, we bumped and relocated a number of times, I think pretty effectively and efficiently. But you know, be assured, all the major uh, situations that we're going to be 
um, you know, in that line. So with that request, can I request somebody make a recommendation? Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion to defer this until after the retreat. Okay. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Mr. Moss. Discussion. Traditionally, our retreats have not been televised. So if we're having this discussion at the retreat, and it's to make sure that the public is participating and is observing the discussion as you suggested, then we'll need to have a different standard of audio and video support if, in fact, we're going to hold true to that commitment that this discussion is not, it's public, but no one such as here can hear it. That's not the same thing as watching it. So if we are doing it at the retreat, which I'm not opposed to, Mr. Mayor, then the staff has to make the appropriate thing so that, in fact, Eve, that it may not be live broadcast, may just be Facebook, and then we do something else. But if we're saying that we want the public to have the benefit of the discussion process, then there has to be some kind of broadcast of the event. My only other concern is, and I don't want, is that when we defer things, if I guess every each of the candidates who wants to be it or other people should, well, what is going to be the outcome? What is the product of the discussion? Is it a timeline? Is the threshold? Is it the process? The nice, you know, email memorandum with the city attorney sent with us and shared with us important. So I think it's going to be important in the material that we get or propose that we have a little checklist of at the end of the discussion that we're having that somehow we can't take votes at those meetings, as you know, but what's the consensus we're trying to achieve on the process and the business rules for getting there should be something that we're, that's going to be produced by the offsite. And, and I realize tonight isn't the time at this hour trying to achieve that. So I'm with you on that, Mr. Mayor. But we really do need to have some kind of structure to get an outcome that guides us going forward. And I, my view, and I I'll, guess I'll say that for the retreat, but I do think we have to have a, a structured process to get to an end product. Okay. Mr. Dehaney. Mr. Mayor, the only thing I'd like to add is that if um, the intent is for it to be broadcast, we're projecting it to be in Building 19. We can't broadcast at Building 19, Facebook Live, or... The motion on the floor is to do it after the retreat, right? Mm -hmm. Am I correct? Yeah, we're going to actually have the vote and everything, so there will be other discussion. And if you can excuse me one second. And Mr. Moss, with due respect, you know, the uh, you know public is going to be included, you know, publicly during a vote. But the, the, this is the voting body right here that is going to make the decision, and that's where the discussion should focus. I agree. I didn't make the comment yeah. about public transparency. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mrs. Henley. Uh, well, um, having, having a public discussion doesn't necessarily mean being televised. And, you know, I, I think it will be public. It won't be a closed door discussion. Um, as, as it has, was pointed out to us uh, by the uh, uh, city attorney, is that we really don't have our process of how we're going to do this and what our, our rules are going to be. And he sent us a couple of very good uh, memos on the different possibilities. And so I think we do need to determine how we're going to conduct this and as our process. But I'll tell you <laughs> plainly, you know, being hit with this pick a, a new vice mayor thing, totally unexpected. And I'm thinking, I'm not sure I would really like to observe people during the whole day of the retreat and see how people interact with each other, how people uh, conduct themselves in this uh, situation, and be thinking about people as possible vice mayors. Uh, we haven't had that opportunity since it was just kind of uh, put out there that when it was totally unexpected, as the mayor said, I really need the time. If I'm going to vote for someone to be vice mayor, I want to have the opportunity to assess people as a possible vice mayor to determine who I'm going to support. If I had to vote tonight, I would have to abstain because I don't know which of the three, if these are the three, that I would support. And so I need that time the day of the retreat to be able to see people in action, how they relate to the council, and be able to make my selection. So that's where I'm coming from. And that was, to be honest with you, Mrs. Henley, that was part of the uh, 
rationalization for having the discussion during the retreat. They've set the timelines and the procedure, but also, you know, when people watch people in action in terms of, you know, what's going on, you know, that was part of the intent. Mr. Bellucci. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and and I certainly have no issue myself with the deferral, and I think Mrs. Henley certainly makes a good point about the importance of collegiality and relationships and working together. Um, of course, we've been working together for a matter of years now, um, and, and, and that, that provides at least some context that's worthy of consideration, but I don't discount in any way what, what you said about the importance of um, what the retreat could have on that formulation. But I'm, I'm also, but really the purpose of my comments were, um, I think the motion was to defer until after the retreat, but there was no date certain to that. And I would feel more comfortable um, with an establishing a, a timeline, and, and I, I, I don't speak for those who are considering um, being candidates for that position, but they, I suspect they would also be more comfortable with a date certain than a than a just a, a deferral in, 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 in indefinitely unless there was um, unless Mr. Jones had a, a rationale behind that that he'd like to share. Just the last meeting. Yeah. The twenty first, but what we could have a special Yeah, I, I, I was we thinking about a special, a special meeting on the twenty third. A special meeting that might be dedicated solely to the vice mayor because if we have it the night of a meeting you know, there's a lot of things going on, and you know, but if we could do that right at, you know, call a special meeting on the 23rd, that would be strictly dedicated to this, and that way it would be a televised thing. And I guess that would be my request: is that we establish that date tonight, if if council has, has no objection. Have a particular date. Well, I tell you, but well, but once again, we can you know discuss that at the you know at the retreat. Yep, yeah, Mr. Rouse. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to understand if. That date, what does that date coincide with the discussion on Lynn Haven seat? Because that's that's also, I'm sure, we don't know how many candidates we're going to get, but we're going to be appointing a seat as well. Is that October? So, um, right now, the timeline for that is um, we receive the applications no later than the 17th. Um, you all, uh, City Council, will review um, that following Tuesday in closed session and create a short list. And um, public interviews will be planned for the 28th of September, That's yeah. a special which meeting. will be a special meeting. Yeah, and then if we have the special meeting prior to, and you know, we can get, uh, you know, a, you know, a vice mayor seated, you know, prior, you know, to the yes. election. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. It does. Thank you. All right, so uh, we had a motion and a second. Can we open the vote? Uh, what? What? Okay. <laughs> I mean, wait. Okay, I'm sorry. We set the date. That's the key. Uh, I, I think we need a, a revised. Okay, revised. Uh, uh, I think we need a motion that specifically states and when I, you're I'm conducting a vote. Yeah, okay. Mr. Mr. Uh, Jones would like to amend the motion. I, I amend my motion to uh, defer the matter until the 23rd of September. Okay. At a special meeting. At a special to be meeting called to be called by the mayor at the direction of council. Yes, yeah, specifically to the uh, the election of a vice mayor. Okay. We'll and do we to get the second again? Yes. Okay. Votes open. You got to open the vote, Terry. Could use the time. One second. Okay. Mr. Berlucci, you may I have your vote, please. Thank you. By a vote of 10 to 0, that motion oh has passed. <laughs> okay. Is there any new business? Okay. At this time, we will adjourn into open mic. Give us just a second. We'll be ready. Open mic. I still stand up.